Welcome to the College of Complexes. My name is Tim, and I'd like to welcome all of you tonight to our uh, illustrious gathering tonight. Uh, the College of Complexes has two rules. One is one fool at a time, and the second one is no personal attacks. The College of Complexes consists of the following format. One, our, we'll have a brief announcements period. Two, we will then let our speaker speak for a little while. And then afterwards is a question and answer period. And uh, after that, we'll have our infamous rebuttal period. And tonight, Charlie is gonna be talking about Bigfoot and the interruptions of wood. Ha ha ha. All right, so Charlie, let's get started with the announcements when you're ready. Okay, welcome everyone to meeting number 3000. 664 of the College of Complexes, the playground for people who think. Okay, starting next week on May the 7th, we'll have our, uh, oh, wait a minute, before I get out of it, we have a Google email group, which you're all invited to sign up for, and we also have a meetup group, so you get one or two notices per week to keep you up to date regarding the upcoming programs. And although I am not a capitalist, I will give an advertisement for our upcoming program. On May the 7th, we will feature our annual May special May Day speaker, Gene Lentz, who has a radio talk show affiliated with the AFL-CIO. He's got a PowerPoint presentation on the issue of labor, looking back, around, and forward. So I hope to see you next week to celebrate May Day at the college. Transitioning into May 14th, the Truth Brigade will be here. So they help you to ascertain nonsense and fiction from what is accurate and valid. On May the 21st, we'll look at health disparities regarding COVID and long COVID in particular. So that should be a good program. There's a project gathering data regarding that. On May the 28th, um, I just spoke with these people again. Uh, they're going to be addressing the issue of the right wing takeovers of public meetings and schools, disrupting meetings with their agenda and how to combat and deal with disruptive audiences. This, you should remember that. June the 4th, uh, going into June, uh, our own Professor Bob Lichtenberg will talk about uh, making meaning and our topics will focus on philosophical topics uh, regarding our status in the in the universe. On June the 11th, we're gonna say, if you haven't seen this, we've added to the schedule, we're gonna have a debate to ascertain if Jesus was a communist. <laughs> so that should be a hot one. On June the 18th, Dan Bader, um, is, is, is community psychologists will be looking at the incidents and the psychosis of hoarding, <laughs> overdoing materialism. Uh, so that's on June the 18th. The next open dates, therefore, are June 25, um, and then July 2nd and the 9th. So if you'd like to speak, Please help me out and come up with a title and program description. <coughs> we haven't spoken before. It'd be a good time of the year to do it. Okay, Tim, take it away. Okay. Uh, and I'd also like to let everybody know we do have a Dallas campus that meets on Thursday nights. And, uh, you know, I just also like to let you guys know that. Uh, um, we're, you know, it's sometimes worth it. I haven't had a chance to go myself because of, um, you know, I'm usually pretty busy with my Toastmasters uh, stuff. 
but uh, you know what I'll do is I'll introduce Charlie and we'll get right into the right into the uh, speeches here in a second. So I'll give you a formal introduction, Charlie, if you don't mind. Um, just give me a second, please, to get the uh, stuff up here because I'm going to introduce you in a special way. All right. Okay, here we go. All right. And tonight, from the high desert in Algonquin, Illinois, and from the south side of Chicago, proof there is a primitive species living in the forests of the U.S. and the need to preserve and restore their habitat. Charles Paydock, Secretary of the Chicago Greens, will speak on cryptozoology and why the lumber industry, land conservation, and urban sprawl should be stopped. All right, Charlie, take it away. All right. Welcome, everyone. Glad to see you here tonight. Okay, there we go. And this has a way of introduction to give you my credentials and background. I'm a long-term member and lobbyist, uh, Secretary of the Chicago Greens, and a lobbyist on, on ecological issues. So, and I know everyone's going to vote green. All right. What we're going to hear are arguments for closing down all logging, all logging operations so as to preserve and expand forests as a habitat for relic hominids and endangered and elusive species. By the way, Tim, thanks for the intro. Close. There you can see that's what we're going to do to lumber mills. Just a note on a little side here. Yesterday was National Arbor Day, and I posted the poem from the turn of the century, 1900. So, on woodman, spare that tree, touch not a single bough. In youth, it sheltered me, and I'll protect it now. And that's what we're all going to do after the end of this program. Okay, going back in time on this topic. We can go all the way back uh, to Aristotle, actually, 350 BC. And a lot of people don't realize this, but they regarded themselves as natural philosophers, philosophers of nature. And about 25% of Aristotle's uh, canon or uh, writings constituted uh, a, a field research. And I look at the bottom there, in particular, he, he noted, I looked this up, he spoke about eight monkeys that have been observed and all such creatures, they're, they're under dissection to correspond with those of man. By the way, on a number of these slides, I have a lot of printing. There's no need to read it all. Uh, kind of those are for me to read and summarize. So uh, you can relax reading those. Anyhow, that's Aristotle is the, uh, we can trace it back. Now bringing us further up to date, just this week in Congress, they're introducing what is known as the Earth Bill. And it has three sections. The second, one of the middle section is on something called regenerative agriculture. And that's where you find topics relating to forests and trees and wildlife habitat. This is introduced being live right now in the U.S. Congress. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, also, you, I have spoken on this once before, uh, the Green New Deal. There's some rare versions of this out there. The Illinois Greens have their own version, slightly different. Nevertheless, the Green New Deal of AOC and it has six sections. Earth Bill has three. This one has six. Don't need to read that because our next slide is going to cover it. But the calls for the restoration of the American landscape and forest. Forests are badly in need, threatened by drought, wildfire, invasive species. And this is only exacerbated by climate change. Uh, and we're seeing. Uh, the, why is this important for the reduction of about 600 million tons, million tons 
of carbon dioxide. Uh, and we could offset the emissions 45% fairly easy, simply through forestation. Now, where did this all begin, this topic tonight? It began in a period long ago called the Miocene, uh, 5 million years ago. And this was the foundation of life on Earth. People don't realize this. And this is when the species of land animals evolved. Dogs, cats, horses, bears, elephants. Uh, and we get the current climate, life, and geography. So uh, this is why we call it Miocene hominid. OK. The next one is, this is a, called the taxonomy, which I have put together. And there you see the human species and its relatives, the primates. Uh, I added Bigfoot in, or if you want to use the term, we'll get into it, Sasquatch. It goes under various names. But I've inserted uh, a relative of humans, which I assert uh, needs to be added to this taxonomy. The evolution of primates began actually 55 million years ago uh, in terms of uh, monkeys, apes, and humans, and continues to this day. Okay, you can look, you can see the yeah, new world, old world monkeys. Okay. I find I have to verify this, but regarding the primates, we are primates we're discussing tonight. There are 300 species of primates. This is amazing. But what distinguishes them? Generally, they, are long, they have longer childhood and lifespans, larger brains relative to their body size. They rely on sight, stereoscopic vision and color rather than smell or, and they have opposable thumbs. Um, they, we really don't have snouts. We basically have flat noses and we're not like canines or bears or something of that nature. And you can see where I place Bigfoot is advancing even beyond humans. Now, also during this period of development is called the Stone Age. I've spoken on this. this amazingly enough, this covers 99% of human history. Um, and it ended up for we could just say about 5,000 years ago, uh, uh, man existed in this fashion. Now, the thing that broke this up there was during this time period, uh, you, a lot of times you think there's a straight line of evolution. That's not necessarily the case. During this period, the species were evolving and what took place was called punctuated equilibrium. Like if you look at the meaning of the words, uh, it broke the, the trend. Uh, there's sudden spurts and dramatic changes, which brought about the species inhabiting the earth today. Uh, the fossil record verifies this. So there you see. Okay, now this is my basic premise is, uh, is that in the development of the primates, and particularly humans, uh, there's a thing called no two species occupy the same niche. And what that means is there is competitive exclusion. One species will replace the other. They can only one occupying the space. And in humans, humans uh, adopted technology and predation as their mode, primary mode, whereas I maintain there was another parallel uh, species, the primates, who went more towards nature and pacifism. That's whom we're going to be discussing tonight. So that keep that framework in mind like this. And to show you establishes uh, Homo sapiens, if anything that distinguishes them, an early, early species was called Homo habilis. The handyman is what did man do with his skills? He made weapons. That's his tool, the tool maker. He had skills to make tools. And what did he do? He made a wide array of weaponry in order to sustain. And what he and to verify that they in fact did this, they you need a high protein diet for the development of the brain. 
And that's where our through eat meeting, meat eating, killing, predation, and meat eating resulted in increase in cranial capacity and development of the human brain. That's not disputed. That's that's a fact. Uh, parallel development of this. Now, what was the other thing I was talking about? The human species is basically let's say took place in Africa. In the meantime, in Asia, however, a parallel development was taking place. One of the species that's recognized is Gigantopithecus. Now about 75% of the animals in North America came from Asia over the Bering Straits during the period when passage was possible. But these were, uh, uh, precursors to Homo sapiens in North America. They they came traced out of China, Vietnam, and Thailand. Now, just as an aside, when the American troops were fighting in Vietnam, they reported encountering uh, animals. They called them rock apes. The Vietnamese called them forest people to indicate that this species. Uh, you can see the size. Like, suits the name perfectly. These are quite significant creatures in size. And you could see how uh, for various reasons they could evolve into the Bigfoot. Uh, to give you further evidence of this, uh, the Midwest in Illinois, there's a museum that has a specimen of this. Uh, woolly mammoths were present in the Midwest having crossed over from the land bridge. Lewis and Clark were instructed to look for them by Jefferson. Now, this is 300 years of existence. I'd say it's more 200 years, 200,000 years. Um, we have to realize, according to Charles, Homo sapiens have shared the planet with other species. This is true. And as I said, the two species occupy the same niche. And there you get an indication of those are accurate. Um, uh, pictures of various species of uh, the Homo sapiens, which have, and look at there, you see <clears throat> below that here. Also included in this might be considered indigenous people. And we'll get evidence of that further on. Okay. Uh, one of the things that distinguishes the hominids uh, among the primates was uh, bipedalism as opposed to being quadrupeds. Other, other animals are quadrupeds. This is primarily uh, the, in this human evolution, there came about Homo erectus. Uh, you could see all the grass in the plains and could run very quickly. Uh, one of the reasons this is still evident today Homo erectus is, and the reports of Bigfoot that's getting out of ourselves. But uh, homeowners will report that they will go outside and all the fruit in their trees will have been picked. Cherries and apples and so forth, clean of all fruit that could only be achieved by a, 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 a someone with uh, of quite stature obviously to clean a tree off. Okay, uh, I, I included this. This is one of the uh, species of human that evolved, probably the most well-known is Australopithecus, a bipedal primate with human characteristics. That's what I mean. There's a primate with human characteristics from the Pliocene. Now I, I included within the square so you can understand how taxonomy works. There's kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus. And the amazing thing is, uh, this brings further justifies what I'm going to say tonight, is that the fossil record reveals that these Australopithecus remain essentially unchanged throughout their long history. And anyhow, taxonomy is quite a complex topic and far beyond our, our discussion here tonight. This was a popular book 
when I was growing up, uh, a bestseller book uh, by Desmond Morris, The Naked Ape, in which his assertion was, was that uh, the only thing distinguishing uh, humans from monkeys and apes was their, their lack of uh, fur, basically. So this was a very popular book. Highly recommend you take a look at it, it's so relevant. Now, what is it we're studying here tonight? We're studying a topic, a subject matter called cryptozoology. Studies of unknown, legendary, or extinct animals. Now, these animal species have been around for some time, which we want to wonder if they in fact exist or not. You see it in heraldry, uh, lions and dragons. St. George, the patron saint of Lithuania, killed a dragon. Also in the British crown, you have a unicorn. Now, cryptozoology is a multidisciplinary field with requiring working knowledge of many disparate topics, which I might say that I have mastered. But anyhow, you can see the British crown. You could either go on the left and enjoy life, un, un, obey the laws of the government, or you could go on the right and you could be foolish like the unicorn and disobey and commit crimes and do whatever you want. Be libertarian, do something. Okay. Uh, Really, the subject of cryptozoology and the terminology actually began um, by a Frenchman uh, zoologist who put out a book in 1955 on the track of unknown animals. And in furtherance of his, his views in the museum in France, their display case dedicated yet to Yeti or Bigfoot or, or Sasquatch, depending on it, is, is set up and ready to go for uh, when they get a skeleton of one of them to put on display, which has not been done, achieved to date. But they're all set and ready to go. And I don't think you have to convince them about the authenticity of the subject of cryptozoology. They wouldn't do that for no reason. Now, now here's a little fun thing. I just wanted to talk about some of the animals and legends. In China, uh, you have this Nian monster. And in order, he was afraid, however, of bright lights, loud noises, and didn't like the color red. And that would get rid of them. So next time you celebrate Chinese New Year uh, or see right, red in households and so forth, they're acting on this fear of Nian to keep them out of their neighborhoods. I agree. Another thing uh, regarding cryptozoology, uh, the, to show you how, how little, we, actually it's even said that we only know about 15% of the species that have existed. Nevertheless, the pandas only come about from 1936. Actually, the pandas also demonstrate attributes much like Bigfoot. They're solitary, calm, calm like me, yeah, unless you threaten them and you invade their space. And then they show dangerous behavior. So that's what I mean. We uh, learned that. Now this is very well. I have been up to Burlington and Vermont working with Bernie Campaign. And up in Lake Champlain, they got the animal called Champ. Uh, swimming around. Um, there you can see a picture of them in the center. They try to put boat out on the lake in sonar. They thought they were going to get, you know, trap or figure trap uh, the animal. And what he did was he surfaced and he almost knocked over the boat. That'll teach him to come after the aquatic animals. Okay. Now it's also, this is a really a valid thing. Also humans, I mentioned indigenous species also exist in isolation, unchanged. 
And one of those is the Tassidae, which is a primitive culture uh, in the Philippines in the 70s. They had no contact with the outside world. They spoke no known language. Um, and they had no, no word for the sea because they never saw it. And they had no word for weapons of civil war. Now they did have a little exposure to the outside world. So they weren't completely isolated. Some have tried to say this was not accurate, but they were in fact an isolated indigenous people. And there's been other instances of this, but that's not our topic here tonight. Regarding legendary monsters, you can go to this every state. This is amazing. In every state, just about every state, you can find uh, uh, information on a, a monster living there. I picked out Indiana, uh, where they were. There was somebody in the river. A girl was, was trying to free herself, and was dragged down by some monster with a hairy clan. Uh, he had a green hand. Uh, he put some slime on her, which he couldn't get rid of. But that's residing someplace in Indiana. <laughs> Doesn't surprise me. <laughs> Here you see all, all United States. Uh, and they picked out some of the major ones uh, of hidden animals uh, in, in nature. OK, um, let's see what else. This is just another thing that have existed in the United States fear of these in, uh, in the Ohio, West Virginia. At one time, uh, they had closed down the local schools because they feared a dangerous creature was roaming about the town. Now, where did uh, you get the term to use our big foot? We'll get into that. Sasquatch is, is more commonly used or a, a cryptid. Uh, Sasquatch comes from the Chehalis Pacific Coast Indian tribe. But there were over 100 terms <laughs> for creatures like this, actually 140 names used by Native Americans to describe a wild man of the woods that they had encountered. I like <laughs> one said that his, they translated as the boss of the woods. He was the boss. Okay, let's see what else. Oh, this is, uh, if you uh, get out in the totem poles, um, Bigfoot is often depicted, Sasquatch is depicted on totem poles. Actually, it takes the form more often of Zanukwa. Zanukwa is a, a cannibal woman. <laughs> and she goes around and, and, and gets children and puts them in a sack and takes them off. Uh, and there you can see her getting a child there on the right. She's uh, it's hard to interpret it, uh, totem poles, but Shinaqua is uh, easily recognized. And by the way, it, it kind of she whistles or something. She makes a whistling sound, and that's why she's got an oval mouth. Also, <laughs> very well known is this monkey mask from a tribe in British Columbia. Uh, a Kazikuril type tribe of Pacific Coast. Okay, um, let's see. Oh, I, I, now petroglyphs. I like petroglyphs, and this is well known. There's a Sasquatch, uh, uh, probably 800 to 1,000 years old, rec <laughs> recorded in rock art. And there you can see on the upper left is a what would appear to be a Bigfoot. Actually, in, re in the real world, that, that illustration is eight and a half feet tall. It's, it's huge, it's life size. They put it that, that big, apparently for a very valid reason. And they were depicting in this rock art, only things I say and others that they actually had knowledge of, that they knew. So they put a picture of an eight and a half foot uh, creature uh, in the rock art. Oh, this is one other thing that's mentioned different names. This is often here. There's other names for Bigfoot, Jackal, 
And I like the one Windigo. This was from the Indians where I live, the Seneca and Tuscarora and the Alleghenies. And they had dealings with Bigfoot. Actually, when they saw footprints, uh, we'll get into the topic of footprints. When they saw footprints of Bigfoot, they actually would move the camp, the village to another location. They didn't want to deal with them. <laughs> they thought the, uh, the primates were coming to steal their food. So you can see how the early... <laughs> By the way, as we're talking, man, he mentioned Art Bell. I'm not going to talk about, nor do I pay any attention. It's generally called Woo, W-O-O. -O, right? It's our Woo Woo. All this supernatural stuff that they're... Uh, um, come from spaceships and they can cloak themselves and all this and they're interdimensional. That's a lot of woo, woo woo. Um, basically, when it comes down to these primates, they find you, you don't find them. That's what you're mixing up. And there's nothing magical or mysterious about this. Another report that's well often talked about, Davy Crockett wrote in a letter that he had uh, encountered a creature with the shape and shade of a large ape man. Uh, Daniel Boone also re reported on it. Regarding the forest, the, we're getting the forest now. Uh, amazingly enough, 45% of the arable land in the United States has not been surveyed. It's wilderness. And as much as 50% of the world has said, now, if you look at these maps, we'll see later on the map of sightings, but the U.S. forests correspond exactly with the reports of sightings of Bigfoot. Take a look. Remember that map? Keep it in your mind. Okay, there are 700. Where does, where does Sasquatch live? There's 765 wilderness areas with 52 million acres. There's plenty of land out there. Now, this is what I mean. The pioneers came here and they did their best to get ready forests out of this country. Uh, Abe Lincoln there, chopping down trees all day long, the rail splitter. But unfortunately, they didn't make a dent in the, ah. in the overall. This is some of the things the loggers would do. I actually worked for a while for the wire hauser company. Uh, as a technical information librarian. I go through photos like this. Look at this. Uh, this is what's going on today, and this has got to be stopped. I did a tour of Washington and Oregon. I've been there several times in British Columbia. You can see these trucks all over the place. Look at these guys. Up to no good death for sure. These guys are not members of the Glee Party. I guarantee you. Okay, now I just wanted to throw this in. A lot of people don't know, but look, they, they have actually mobile lumber mills. Uh, they have attachments on a boom. Chop the chop, they just clamp it on a tree, chops it down, debarks it, gets rid of any branches, uh, spins, they can just, and then they take that and load it on a truck. It's a log ready to go. That we saw in the previous photo, blocks that were, were down like telephone poles already, ready to go. And they can go to the mill for furnish, further furnish, finishing if necessary. How much wood are we consuming? A lot. 300,000 carloads are going on the trains. And one of the things, uh, lumber companies, they're not tolerating any green interference with their activities and they hire honors to chase you away. We'll see about tree sitters, but they hire and they're guarding. They're not there to make you friendly, to welcome you. They, they don't want anybody. Another thing that's happening to the land and the forest you can see here at the top, it's forest that's disappearing. And every day, 600,000 acres of open space are lost. <laughs> The things like mining operations. Uh, uh, 
like for nuclear reactors, uranium or thorium. Yeah, this is you want thorium or forest. It's your choice, and that's what you got. It's up to you folks. Do you want this or do you want a forest? Uh, why do we need forests? Because it's it's called a carbon sink. It traps CO2 gases. There's 750 billion trees in the United States that work for cleaning up our pollution. We need to have them. Then I see the Canadians here, Charles, my nephew is here. The Canadians in particular, uh, the boreal forest uh, is the world's largest intact forest. However, it's being lost at the rate of 1 million acres per year. Uh, that's got to be stopped. And there you can see a postage stamp. The Canadians don't have any problems recognizing Sasquatch as a species. The little thing I probably known about is that we talked about Pleiocene periods and things like that. At one time, amazingly enough, there were no forests anywhere on Earth. And this continued for 5 million years. And that's how we're going to end up unless we listen to guys like me. They're telling you, stop what you're doing now. Uh, when I was growing up, this was a big issue. You don't have to read all of this. Basically, the, the heavy industry of Chicago and Indiana and Pittsburgh, the soot was floating over the East Coast, Mid-Atlantic, up to New England and creating acid rain, which were, which were killing the forest. It's still going on <laughs> today. And this is what they do on the campus uh, of Harvard in the winter, they covered statues because it eats away this ass. Can you imagine what it does? If it goes into a statue, rock and, and stone and metal, can you imagine what it does to a tree? That's what I mean, we're still at it. Uh, okay, this is what the lumber companies, um, we have to, we're losing at a precipitous rate forest due to fires. And the lumber companies say, cut down more trees and you won't have fires. Uh, it'll be less fuel. This is ridiculous. But anyhow, we all know that with climate change, um, that the fire, remember here, climate change, by the way, this is one you should read, has intensified summertime drought, reduced mountaintop snowpack, making fire seasons longer, and even increased lightning strikes that can trigger big fires in tinder dry forests. All right, I know all about uh, uh, lightning living in Kansas. Yes, it can in fact do it. So we're talking into a perfect storm here. This is what we're doing. Is that what you want? Blazing fire like that. Another thing we're doing too, you guys are all city dwellers. Uh, this is a key term not often used. What? Woodland urban interface, wildland urban interface. And that's why even more land is being gobbled up every day for these pristine suburbs like Algonquin. Um, okay, another thing that's coming with climate change is a increased threat over the cascade um, by marauding insects. Their range is increasing, their numbers are increasing. Increase the perf they love the climate warming. And this is what you end up with botchful pine beetles. <laughs> Look, I, I'm simply cutting a swath through this. Anyone who's dealt with a plant disease, it's, it's very impossible to stop it or insect infestation. Anyone who has house plants, has, has experienced, knows there's nothing you can do uh, once it gets going. All right, another thing we've got to stop is fracking and oil, these pipelines. Guys, you guys in your gas guzzling SUVs, you want all this gasoline. Well, that churning up, cutting through the forest. Why do you think they lay a pipeline? You think they go around the forest? Don't kid yourself. They go right through it. When they want to frack for oil, they think nothing to chop it down a whole forest putting up oil well. That's what you get instead of trees, you get an oil well. Okay, and regarding what's left of our forest, a little bit of history here. 
I've been to these. Uh, there are places in the United States, I've actually sought out these to go to, are the old growth forests, such as the Allegheny National Forest in Pennsylvania, where I resided. Uh, and you have 300 year old trees and blocks. You have the 10 old trees, seven of them are in the United States, our forest state back. And at 5,000 years old, there's a bristlecone pine, um, the oldest known living tree in the world is still around. Its location is a guarded secret. Probably some lumberjack would try to chop it down. There's another thing, there's a thing called wilderness areas. And in this idol, I've actually been into the Idaho River of no return wilderness. And that goes on forever. It's the largest designated. You can't actually cross Idaho from south to north. At least when I was there, there was no road. You just you had to fly over. But there is a national wilderness preservation system which 803 areas. And it's an area where a man himself is a visitor who does not return. Okay. By a little aside here, uh, happy birthday to the National Park Service. They turned 150. I remember being in Yellowstone when they turned 100. They had a big celebration, constituting one of the lar last large intact ecosystems in the Northern Temperate Zone. So we've done something right. It's not all doom and gloom. There is a hidden area called Area X, undisclosed that no one, this is a possible location, habitat of Bigfoot. And I I know where it's at, but I don't think. I found this rather interesting. Some guy was using Google Earth and he discovered uh, a forest on top of a mountain peak in Africa. I can imagine what lives inside there. A lot of states are still covered by forest. You can see some of them. Illinois doesn't rank very high. We're only about 12%, but some states still maintain a significant uh, uh, forest acreage. Okay, there's Illinois. Um, the Trust for Public Land is trying to preserve this wilderness uh, in protected places. <laughs> and you can see <laughs> forest present perhaps down in the Shawnee area. I got to know this, her Julie, I used to call her Julia Jones, Butterfly Jones, but she spent uh, 738 days stopping them from chopping down a tree, sitting tree sitting a tree. Uh, but yeah, she, I got to know her in the, in the Greens community. She would come through on occasion to Chicago, to Chicago, Butterfly Jones. Anyhow, I, I was like these, I love these Hallmarks, but there was an episode of the Hallmark movies in which an activist girl was keeping them from chopping down a tree. <laughs> And she fell in love with the lumberjack. So it turned out okay, I guess. <coughs> now logging companies should shut down altogether simply because take a look at that. A tree farm is not a forest. No way. Look at that. That's a forest. Everybody should own a field guide to trees. You can get these in museum book, museum stores. Uh, useful to bring along with you. When I go off on a trip to the woods, I bring along my guide, guidebook, field guide, and a microscope. Um, this is another thing. This was a book that just came out and was in the news. A Canadian retired academic. She's producing uh, climate change resistant trees, and she's offering the seeds to anyone who wants them that can specifically. Uh, withstand uh, heat. Now that we do talk about GMOs, this is what you end up with GMO trees. If, if that's what you want, think that's a forest? Look at that. That's ridiculous. 
Look at this. <laughs> Come on. Looks like an orchard. Oh, look at the leaf. Look at. <laughs> Anyhow, that's what the, the mad scientists are up to. I've had this book for years. It's been out in a couple editions. And I know the secret life of the forest. When I take people in the wilderness and yell at them, I always say, you look at what I look at, but you do not see what I see. I highly recommend everybody get a copy and go ask to it to learn the secret life. And you too will know the secret life of the forest. Okay, you're halfway through. Uh, the thing about trees is that they are uh, developing a means of communication, studies indicating that they can talk to one another. I'm not precisely certain how. Now, one of my favorite areas of investigation is Yeti. First showed up, this was discussed in 1921 and uh, came about in the thick history of the expeditions on Mount Everest. Uh, and uh, what you have to realize, why I like Yeti, I think Yeti definitely exist. And there's someone called the Mande Burren. It's an ape-like creature said to inhabit subtropical forests in the hills of Northeast India. And I don't perceive why this, there, that is, sir, would certainly establish Yeti as a species. Uh, they, the, I said earlier that this species developed in Asia and Vietnam, Northeast India uh, and, and China as well. One of the first things regarding the existence, even Marlon Perkins on the Wild Kingdom gave one of, dedicated one of his first shows on the TV show, which is still on reruns, uh, Mutual Bomo's Wild Kingdom. Okay, this is a, a cool story. There even was a Yeti who helped out a Buddhist monk, a hermit, uh, Swangba Dolje. And he, the Yeti would bring him food, water, and fuel. And he even studied Buddhism. That's a, <laughs> Anyhow, this is why I'm saying that state creatures can, can go from the grasslands higher. They have to understand what a tree line is. I've been above the tree line. This is where the trees get smaller. So they disappear. You end up with short grass, tundra, and then this is where your snow would begin. Um, and there you can see how it operates. Uh, the upper tree line, uh, you can in the Rockies, this, you can in fact uh, travel up it's like 15,000 feet. Uh, the air gets a little difficult to breathe. Uh, but nevertheless, this is what I mean. A species like uh, the Yeti, uh, where people say, well, what does he live on? Can't eat snow. Uh, actually, there are animals that share the the Arctic climate, goats and so forth, which are sustenance. But he could, he's actually, his basic residence is from the uh, tree line area. This is an adult, does, the government is getting involved. They persuaded the government, the FBI, to look into, uh, they had ways, the crime lab, uh, to look at hair samples. If they were in fact a species uh, but after some time, uh, they just said, no, this is just, just some deer, deer, deer thing. Now there have been 20, 20 contacts of um, the US Army soldiers with Bigfoot at 20 bases. And there were even got photos of here. I believe that was a specimen of Bigfoot, which they're taking away. Uh, but the Ar Army is completely silent on this. If you go to the Fish and Wildlife Service, they'll tell you they have no report. This is amazing. They have no reports of sightings. The whole Fish and U.S. Forest Service, land management, all those things. They say, oh, we don't know what you're talking about. There's, oh, this is kind of wild. But once in a while, somebody's claiming that Bigfoot is a, an escaped monkey or something. Um, some government experiment, who knows? Maybe they are, they were working on COVID. Fushi, uh, one of Fushi's animals got off. This is one thing 
They say, why don't we have specimens uh, of, a, of a, a Bigfoot or Sasquatch skeleton or to study? And, and that's because they tried, the guys have tried sending things they located, specimens of Bigfoot. Uh -huh. You send it to the, Nat the Smithsonian, and then you, you don't hear from them ever again. You ask them, say, hey, what happened to my specimen? They say, we don't. Yeah, I don't know what you're talking about. We don't have anything. They will deny ever. Don't don't bother sending them anything. You'll never. You might as well just don't bother. Okay, quickly now we're getting through here. There are over three thousand. Here's the evidence: three thousand reported sightings in forty-nine states, the lower states. Um, this is the famous movie, Patterson Gimlin book. Bigfoot, probably have seen it. You don't have time to look at it. It's only one minute. Um, actually, I must say this. I don't give this, I don't accept this as evidence, but that's Charles Paddock. The rest of the Bigfoot community does. Um, it's the best movie ever, video movie ever made for reasons I, I think Patterson was the, was the flim flam guy. And there's more on this. This book's written about this. It's the most analyzed film after the Kennedy um, episode in Dallas examined bit of footage. It's only 68 seconds. Um, in the literature, you'll find plenty to read. Uh, this is a famous uh, horror movie from 19, the classic, The Legend of Boogie Creek. There's all kinds of versions of this uh, Boggy Creek movie, apparently highly recommended. It's also, I like this. It's also listed as a glimpse of lower class swamp culture, but it takes place at Boggy Creek's in Texarkana, Arkansas. <laughs> There's so many videos out there. It's unbelievable. You can find them all over the place on YouTube. Uh, one guy claims uh, linguistics. Um, he worked for the Pentagon that he, I think he's seen a recording of this video. He's learning a talk in his, in Bigfoot. And uh, he does in the program. He, he, he says they got a guy. And the other thing about conversing with a Bigfoot is they're allegedly capable. Their speech is at a a different higher level infrasound that we might not be able to hear. So they communicate at a different frequencies and so forth. Uh, now, when we learn how to communicate with this Sanskrit, I was wondering, what should we tell them about us as a people? What should we tell them what kind of people are humans? Um, also, I little in there, I think people aren't vaccinated, shouldn't be allowed in the forest. We don't want to be spreading COVID among among the forest forest hominids. Okay, is a good map. I want you to take a quick look at this one now. Uh, there you see Sasquatch in North America, Windigo I talked about, Swamp Ape in Florida. Uh, in Russia, you have Alma, the Russian and Chinese soldiers I told you uh, have have shot and gotten, uh, or they call it almasty. Uh, Yeti in Chinese, they put his Yaren. And there's a lot written about the Orang Pendek in Su Indonesia, you can see down there. And there's all kinds of stuff about Yaoi in Australia. Okay, just a little thing, they're out there, I've been in their training. Forest, don't forget, there are three remaining tropical forests in Indonesia, the Amazon, and the Congo, and the endangered species. If you want to get involved in an organization, the National Wood Ape Conservancy, and the other one that's really uh, popular is the BFRO, the Bigfoot. Research Organization, BFRO. This website, if you're going to look at any 
look at the website of the BFRO, and there you can see a guy in area X, which uh, you don't know where it is. A very common, at least discussed episode uh, is goes back to the 20s, in which the um, ape men um, uh, had a fight with some uh, men. And they, there's a location today, many people go to it. It's called Ape Canyon. And the apes didn't like these guys in their territory. And so they bombarded their cabin with rocks all night and tried to break in. Regarding footprints, there's track lines with plasters. They can have as many as 72 foot feet. This was a hoaxer. This is where Bigfoot comes from. This guy in 58, he had a uh, construction company. And he kept made these wooden feet. And he went around in the snow. That's where you get Bigfoot, the term Bigfoot from. It actually was a hoax. He was making fun of the creep cryptologist. And there's all kinds of hoaxers out there still. And it, it ruined the, the sub. You can see there's another thing. There's no dermal ridges, like human skin has uh, things like that. OK, all kinds of collections of big feet plaster casts. You take plaster, and uh, it's upset. There may be an oral sighting, and then you make a cast of it. What are they, why are they called Bigfoot? Human feet, about 5 by 10. Bigfoot is 9 by 16. And the other thing, uh, big feet, they have a, uh, a, a, a mid-tarsal break. The best way I can explain this is humans are kind of flat-footed, whereas they have larger creatures need a mid-tarsal break. And that's why you can tell a phony plaster cast from a real one is that it will not have this mid-tarsal break, which is an authentic one. There's one academic forward really uh, uh, speaks out in researches and studies. Bigfoot Jeff Meldrum at Idaho, and the only other one is found at the College of Complexes. Um, institutional science doesn't want to touch this topic. Uh, and they don't recognize the authenticity of personal experience. This is what Bigfoot is, Roger. There's a lot of things about what does he look like. He comes in different colors, red, brown, black, white, gray. Uh, this was a hoaxer. A guy was posting that he had a photograph. A big, there's, there's not any photos of close up of Bigfoot, and he posted this. But as it turns out, they looked at, debunked it. It, it was himself. He dressed up like Bigfoot and took his own picture. What can Bigfoot live on? This is uh, things that are found in North and South American continents uh, by foraging. There's plenty out there. Um, evidence, you have to look under nature out of place to find evidence in the forest. They even found a handprint, as I mentioned, dermal ridges, they found it in the handprint. Now, the major thing they're looking for, they say that Bigfoot exists, are these stick structures. And I'm not certain if it marks territory. I believe they're marking a territorial imperative. But see, branches are broken off. This didn't happen. There's all kinds of photographs of this. And it, now we're humans, they call it pareidolia. Both Bigfoot and us, we can recognize patterns in nature. That's what I mean. <laughs> Excuse me. And there you can see some more evidence. Sometimes people see things in the forest, think it's an animal or something that's just a log or a tree. Other ways they try to communicate or attract Bigfoot uh, make vocalizations, howls and shrieks. They re recorded them they, and they engage in a lot of tree knocking. It seems to be a form of communication among Bigfoot. Once in a while, there's something called habituation, sustained interaction. People live in the woods and they get to know they have the Bigfoot in where they live. And they even give them names. I ran the one story a woman was describing 
how she had a friend Matilda. Another thing they were doing is uh, uh, this is I mentioned it earlier. COVID, they were inoculating ape ape species to show you the similarities against getting COVID. They're close uh, relatives. Once in a, they, all the time they try to set up game cameras. They haven't been successful in in getting any any footage of Bigfoot. Most of the time you get kitty cats like this. Uh, when they go out to searching for Bigfoot, they make whoops uh, in the wilderness. Um, the that's what I mean. Their vocal tracks are fifty percent larger than now. Bigfoot sounds are called. Maybe we can hear this. Okay, did you hear Bigfoot? Uh, now, another thing, the only real encounters, uh, people will be going down trails and stones will be thrown at them. They never really hit anyone, but they're telling you to stay back, get out of there. Just particularly <laughs> if you're in an area where there's huckleberries, they're like, they'll, they will protect that. So you will get stones thrown at you about the size of softball, they said. Uh, this warning, there was a, a project to get samples of fur, do DNA analysis. There are problems on the collection of this and the ascertaining scientific accuracy. But uh, that was a known project. An interesting new type of research is environmental DNA in which they look in the soil and so forth and tell every kind of uh, species or uh, life form in an area. And it's called environmental DNA. That's what I mean. They might not need a specimen. Engage environmental DNA. You tell, you get the DNA of everything that was in that locale. Okay, now what they do, another thing to attract Bigfoot, it's called gifting. Okay, or apples usually. One woman <laughs> was leaving them little toys. He thought they'd like something to have. Regarding Illinois sightings, in 1917, Illinois had the second highest number of Bigfoot sightings in America, according to BFRO. Mostly from the southern tip, there are specific instances. Uh, there's a report, in, this was just in the Tribune. Um, so there's been apparently 300 sightings. This was northwest of Springfield. Okay, they're down in down south. There's a town, Murfreesboro, and they claim to be the hometown to the big muddy monster, where there's 300 acres of forest. Reports of sightings have been since 1811, right after Lewis and Clark. Uh, Explorer Dave Thompson reported them in the north uh, west areas. And there you can see a rich lady telling them. There you remember the forest. And there's a number of reported sightings in the United States. Look at that. Now in our culture, I realize a lot of people want to jump ahead and they're scared of animals. They see things on Star Trek uh, and, and it's more of a social construct. Oh, they say, I like this. They say, I sense something was watching me. How can you sense something is watching you? Look at this girl. They even in comic books, they have kids thinking that Sasquatch is dangerous. Now, these are actual photos that uh, you can find any number of these posted on the internet. Uh, you can see, I let you be the judge of that. Uh, now, why you say the pictures aren't very good or blurry? Now, if you, I assure you, if you were encountered, if you encountered Bigfoot, everybody seems to run away. They don't hang around and take full pretty photos of Bigfoot. I can assure you, I was in the wood once and I mistakenly came, a, a big moose showed up where I was. And I didn't hang around there to take a picture, I assure you. 
So I can understand what people first uh, goal is in encountering Bigfoot is probably to get out of there. Okay, some guys tried to set up a trap. They spent six years. No, they got a hunt through one time. I don't know why. He went in there and they got up. They, Bigfoot on occasion shows up. They're not totally reclusive. They do show up on occasion in people's backyards. They seem to have some issue with dogs. This dog, they showed up. This dog got so scared. A German Shepherd, it broke back. It ran into the house and was hiding. Another thing about Bigfoot is they apparently have reflective eyes, a different type of membrane. Um, and their eyes are reflective like a deer. It's like that. This is just some goofy movie that I don't know if it's out or not. But they try to combine Indians. Hey, Charlie, it's been about Bigfoot. 45 minutes. All right, I'm almost done. This is almost done. These are hunters. They want to, they, they think the, if they get a, a specimen, they all have to, these make it dangerous. They want to shoot Bigfoot. They claim he's dangerous. They put stuff out like this killer shriek, say killer Sasquatch. And other things, they, you sign these shows with do not pull over. I think it followed me home. Uh, you know, come on. And only one account of the Bigfoot bothering a girl, but as it turns out, she was engaged and ran off with some other guy and told that story. Uh, there's a lot of things that you have to think. Bears are often mistaken for Bigfoot. They stand on foot like this. Children no longer, there's another thing. Children are going up with any, without any experience of, of wilderness or forest because there's no electricity. Uh, there are families, there are sightings of families. There, there are one in Kentucky. Uh, Oklahoma, the site of progressiveness, I actually was issued Bigfoot hunting licenses. If you go in the Ozarks, and you don't want to have to walk around the woods, you can give a few bucks and you can take the Bigfoot expedition truck. And then you'll see not only Bigfoot, but other mysterious characters. Uh, there's field guides. This is what we ended up with is citizen science. And get yourself a field guide. There are videos instructional on how to set up trail cameras. Here, there's the thing, if you want, there's expeditions coming up by BFRO, two types of sightings. And there's a guy, he's playing a flute. He says that'll attract them. There's an expedition coming up in June in Wisconsin. If you want to help maybe locate. Now the other, other thing I say, in dealing with the species, we have to follow the prime directive of Star Trek. And that you do not err, interfere with the natural development of another civilization or grouping. The prime directive. Leave them alone. Like this, you can get a Bigfoot kit, save you some time, give you some instructions on how to go out there. And that's it. Thank you for coming. And I hope you learned something. Okay. Uh, we uh, need to. Uh... Do this real quick. Take your sticky paws off me, you damn dirty ape. Couldn't resist, Charlie. Okay, now. I didn't hear it. Can't have questions. <laughs> I can do it one more time, but uh, okay, one more time. <clears throat> I have a question. Go right ahead. Let's start up with Brian Doheny and then Brian Justin Tucker. So, Brian, go ahead. <laughs> Uh, I was wondering if Charlie could draw parallels between believing in communism as a viable form of government and believing in Bigfoot. <laughs> Good one. Good one, Brian. Well, political theory. What, why don't you believe in communism? What's there to believe? Everyone believes in communism. It's a self-evident truth. You know, you don't, you need evidence of ex exploitation and seeking an alternative. Right. Plenty, plenty of evidence that cooperation is better. 
how do you think Bigfoot would fare in our communist system? You, you, want to compete, <laughs> you want to compete like I showed you, humans got to stop their, I showed you the difference between humans and, and Sasquatch. They're, they are not predators, predatory. Work on it. You can you can grow. I like I like I think you can do it. All right, uh, Justin, then Karina. All right, Mr. Tucker, what do you got? To, what do you need? Hey, to Charlie, know? Uh, I didn't catch the entire. Um, Question, right? I didn't catch the entire uh, presentation, but I do find Bigfoot to be interesting. Um, have you ever heard of Momo the monster? Yeah, uh, there there is a Bigfoot called Momo, I believe. I'm almost certain of it. But I, why did you tell me? Um, uh, Momo is essentially the uh, <clears throat> it's uh, if it's the Missouri. Like, oh yes, yes, yeah. There's all kinds of regional species swamp there's the uh honey island uh apes in new orleans um the 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 most popular one are the grass apes in ohio and pennsylvania the grass apes missouri has was momo uh arkansas has boggy creek monsters um and there's any number of these, uh, but they're in forested areas. Yeah, Momo uh, in the Ozarks, certainly, most certainly. Okay, on the Justin's done, I got four people, Karina, Dan, Michael, and Vicky. So Karina, go ahead. Uh, it is wrong to cut down pristine forests. It's wrong to have a tree farm how do we get our lumber needs met? How do we, where do we get our uh, lumber and our paper from? Well, there are ways of restoring forests. Uh, lumbering simply, you log like a, a path down, this goes back years. You simply, don't do the entire forest. Let's say you you log a road through the a path, a line, a, a section of the forest, and then you wait, and the seeds and so forth, the forest will reclaim that vacant land. Now there's all sorts of things on regenerative means of doing so, uh, and I don't know what what. Do you, do you think we should cut down old growth forests because somebody wants a, a hacienda and take up in suburbia and Algonquin? I mean, we have to have a policy, a national policy. This is consumption. Uh, so do you want to ban wood floors? Should we ban um, wood framed houses? Should we ban wood sidings because it uses wood and that cuts down trees or? I publish a book for the government of the United States on green building technology. There are so many things that one can do without going back and using lumber that look under green building technology. And I represented architects. That's why I knew this. They get certification in it and um, green building technology all kinds of areas and 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 materials that can be used as an alternative to lumber man there's so much on that topic that's what i mean i did research even including uh the internet sources of information on the internet it went on for 10 pages the, the bibliography. There's so many other things you can do regarding housing. 
that would uh, not be What about um, paper products? That it's not, well, that's what I say. There are ways of har reasonable harvesting. More than sufficient to, to, to cover paper needs for the United States. I, you know, that's not the major principle you can some, I don't know the figures, but I would be surprised. Wood pulp is a specific, it, that's been in progress for years in, in Wisconsin. I should know that's where my family's from. I almost will move there. And they restore it already. They, those those uh, paper companies don't move. They're not like lumber companies. Lumber companies come and go, but paper companies are, are locked in. I think largely because of the, the size of the operation. But the, we're getting well beyond the topic here, but paper doesn't does it has already a, a sustainable type of economy. That's what I'd have to say. Yeah, you got that birch, uh, uh, birch type plant uh, trees. All right, Dan. Dan. All right. Yourself. All right, Charlie. Um, did you ever see uh, Sasquatch, big Bigfoot in the forest? Did you personally? Um, I heard of a lot of things in the forest. <laughs> but did you ever? Did you ever see? I had a lot of experiences. Yeah. Um. What specifically? Uh, but to, to to say unquestionably that I yes, took me, hands with Bigfoot, I'd have to say no. no. He said no. He said no. From this okay, so okay. has anybody has anybody ever Even from this said they met him? Met the big I many questions the map, people get around? There's three to four thousand reported sightings. But did anybody? Oh, sure. uh -huh. uh, and there probably are there, more. Because people don't report things okay. to the organization or the police stand. I remember they, another question. They is just there, tell their friends. Is How there many one questions do people getting around? Is there one zoo in the zoo somewhere? Is there, no. No. Okay. But there, it, that's what I mean. I they you have sightings followed up by uh, class. Uh, passed to the print. You don't think that's sufficient evidence? You've got physical evidence. So I saw this big creature marching through the forest, through the mud, whatever, and then he hit a plant. That's what they did with that movie. Right after the guy There's made no, the, no alien. the movie, he went out there and made plaster casts of where the creature walked. So there's no sightings of aliens. There's no actual aliens in a zoo. There's no Bigfoot in a zoo. So maybe there are no aliens yeah, and no Bigfoot. I, I haven't the skills to disprove a negative. <laughs> okay, thank you. All right, Michael, you're well, next. You want me to prove? What are you talking about? Aliens in a zoo? Uh, I have no idea. Well, hey, you got, hey, you guys got to do better than that. All right, let's move on, Charlie. This is nothing. Are there aliens in zoos? Michael, you're next. Uh, Charlie, can you show me the uh, PowerPoint again of the, and the, uh, can you repeat the story of the lady who swam in the Ohio River and something grabbed her legs or something that had a green No, I, I, I can't get, that's too complex. That was a story in Indiana. She swam in the river and and a, a monster. These aren't, there's no, I wouldn't say there's any validity to these reports of, of single case monsters. It's just a story that have appeared which uh, someone maybe planted or what? Yeah, there are people who investigate, you know, um, I'm, you know, cryptozoologist. Uh, there's, they have to, that's what I mean. There's, 
not every, there are hoaxers out there as well. There's kids who make up stories. They're, they're usually told to get lost uh, right away. You know, oh. but there's uh, all kinds of stories of, uh, yeah, the Mothman and uh, Becca Cumbra, this dog, Mexican dog, hairless dog, uh, all kinds of, you know, Loch Ness Monster has been around for decades. So you have to take each, uh, each at a time, one day at a time, one monster at a time. Uh, is Indiana occupied by monsters? It wouldn't surprise me. Oh, okay. right. Vicki, right, you're next. Vicki, yeah. you're next. Go ahead. You guys I are thought... me off easy, man. This I, is nothing. I, I found this talk interesting and intriguing, and I would like to hear more about the tasks a day in the Philippines, if not tonight then at some future date, because a quick Google of them uh, uh, seems to indicate a very elaborate kind of story about them. And I think it could be an evening's presentation. Oh, I'll, I'll make it simple for you. There okay. was a guy who was like our Bureau of Indian Affairs, but he was in charge of the Philippine Department of Indigenous People. And so he said, we have discovered these, he was an advocate for the indigenous people of the Philippines. And so he made public the discovery of the small group of people, the Tassidae. Now they were claiming he was made up the story and that was not true. But they, it was true. They had had very, very, very limited contact with the outside world. Now, the thing why this comes up is that there's a theory among anthropologists that there has to be a minimal population of 1,500 uh, of, the, of the group in order to survive harsh conditions or illness and so forth. Now there's well, that's what I mean. They said there couldn't be, this group was too small to be, uh, to have endured for any extended period of time because there are episodes that would test the population. Now I'm on the side that said, that's a lot of baloney. There are 500 recognized native tribes in the United States, and they existed for a very long time, maybe not thousands of years. And they didn't have that many, they weren't that big. They had villages or two, but they were not that sizable. Now, the other thing in getting in the Dan, I read a lot, there's all kinds of estimates. Like what is the population of, of Sasquatch in the United States? And they've looked at this very carefully. Like that one professor said, there are 75 Bigfoot living in Idaho. He was going to verify that. <laughs> Anyhow, the figures run anywhere from 1,000 to 4,000. But the story that the past today were told to be impossible that a group of people couldn't exist for any extended period of time unless they had sizable numbers. That is an assertion Charles Paydock does not accept. Okay. All right. I, th I thought I had read that there was some hoax to the extent that the Ellie, I, I don't know how to pronounce his name, but he told them to live in caves, even though they didn't live in caves and that they would then get money. But the ultimate conclusion, I thought, was that they were uh, an old tribe, and a, but a forest-dwelling tribe, rather than a Stone Age. And you got to be careful. Cave. There were a lot of people trying to discredit the guy. They even okay. said that they, instead of having their own language, he said they were just pretending to make sounds. 
And somebody oh. said, oh, it's not a language. Mm. That's they just so see it like acting. Act, yeah. He paid them to act like wild men. Right. <laughs> Something you guys could do. All right, Steve, you're yeah. next. Uh, Charlie. Right, Charlie. Thanks. Charlie, on one of your slides, I think it said 39 uh, DNA, uh, samples of Bigfoot material were sent for DNA analysis, but I didn't hear the rest of it. What, what happened there? They had a human genome project, a DNA project. That was one researcher, and she collected 113 samples of what they thought were the fur of Bigfoot. And they would get this from a fence or from a nest or someplace. That's what I mean. The collection was not controlled. And when the only conclusion regarding DNA is that on occasion they give up with, they say, it is no recognizable species. So a lot of it they say is from a horse or a bear, uh, uh, what have you. Also, by the way, I wanted to add, anyhow, that's, does that answer your question? They, they have no recognizable uh, uh, source or species. The other thing about the number of Bigfoot, like he's saying, Dan would say, oh, there's no Bigfoot. There's everybody, Bigfoot are a lot like bears. Oh. And there are all kinds of bears in the United States. And it's often said that Bigfoot has the same habitat as bears. They're almost competitors. And if there's a, if you are, there are as many Bigfoot as there are bears. And believe you me, I, I'm amazed myself at the number of bears there are. Thousands, in the thousands, like in Wisconsin or what have you. All right, Justin, what do you want? Does that have to All right, All right Justin, you're next. Um, so Charlie, um, you had mentioned the Loch Ness not monster. Do you have thoughts about the Loch Ness monster? And have you heard that alleged photos of the Loch Ness monster may just be photographs of erect whale penises sticking out of the water? Uh, <laughs> um, I will admit the photo that is relied upon is people think it's a big monster. It's more like the size of a duck. Uh, it's not a big creature. Uh, another interesting thing, there's a guy who lives on the lake and he lives on donations. And he's been doing it, I think, for 30 years, sitting out there watching, waiting for the Loch Ness Monster. That come along. Uh, there's some issue that uh, the lake is landlocked and it has no outlet to the sea. And that would preclude there being a species. But I don't know enough about aquatic animals um, to say either way. Um, I have watched some things on it, um, but let's say it's under investigation. How's that? Uh, what was that? Bigfoot. All right, uh, Brian, you're next. Oh, he's back. Does a uh, Bigfoot uh, crap in the woods? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually, no, no. There's all kinds of, I didn't get into the topic of scat, they call it, mm -hmm. S-C-A-T. And it is collected as evidence of Bigfoot presence. Like they found huckleberry scat and they said, there must be Bigfoot around here. Actually, uh, Bigfoot kind of go to the toilet in, in a stream. 
that's a uh, that's usually yeah they they're pretty they, yeah well they, they would help clean off their fur yeah they so it makes sense well, yeah although, you know, <laughs> they they're they decided on several occasions i don't i don't buy into this one but okay they claim that they they go to the toilet in streams and that's why you don't find any of it that, that makes sense thanks <laughs> okay, I, i'm up on this topic you guys justin, haven't even challenged me yet all right Man. justin before you got a question charlie i'd like to ask you if you've ever seen the species uh socialist magicus no i think i'm going to though I, I think I'm looking right at him. Socialist yeah. Magicus. And uh, right. the other, my second question is, uh, how common would you consider sightings of Scabby the Rat versus Bigfoot? I actually had a slide on Scabby the Rat and took it out. As, because it was too long as is. I'm sorry if it was too long. But I did have some photos of Scabby when I was talking about legendary animals. Um, I actually, I did look it up. I even said, Scabby comes in different sizes. He's been sighted from six feet to 30. So there's a range. And what is Scabby the rat? Well, ask your boss. Ask... It was invented in Chicago. I believe it was the Plumbers Union and the guy wanted to display something in front of the, and then it caught on among the union guys. Um, we wanted to add some pizzazz. It's actually very good for unions because you can inflate it on the back of a truck, one guy, and you don't need a picket line. And it's probably more effective than a picket line. Employers hate it. They'll call the police everything under the sun to get it out from you put it in front of car dealerships <laughs> giant ones and they hate it uh when scabby shows up no it it's it's really the you don't have to have picket duty you know one scabby but i did have scabby on in the program all right justin you're next all right, so you had said that there's probably not about the same amount of Bigfoot uh, as there are bears. Curious, how come there's no, no, no there like... Are. What? There are. All right. Can, maybe I missed it in your presentation, but... No, no I really can you let can you Can you uh, explain why there's very much more documentation for bears, but not sasquatch i wouldn't say there's more documentation uh well okay you want the textbook answer sasquatch is a species that has learned to live by itself it does not seek interaction it avoids it it does not want confrontation they are peaceful creatures that simply want to be left alone they developed a survival skill by remaining in isolation among themselves and avoiding in confrontations. Now the humans are just a different, are different, same, uh, totally different. And the bear, I assure you, the bear is one of the most aggressive predators in the wild, easily, easily. Bears have, and that goes for polar bears, black bears, grizzly. They have, they respect no boundaries. Whereas Sasquatch is civilized. It's not out there. There's no evidence of Bigfoot ever harming anyone. They'll throw some stones as a warning sign, put out some territorial markers like trees. Don't go any further. You and your pals come along, you see one of them stick stick things, you say, hey, you know, maybe we ought to 
call it quits today. We've gone far enough into the forest. So yeah, they are the different. That's a good. Thank you for bringing that up. They're the antithesis of bears. Okay, Steve, go ahead. Uh, Charlie, these these creatures have been evolving through thousands of generations. Uh, where where are the bones? They you will never find bones in the wild of anything. We have tremendous amount of fossil record of a human. Uh, uh, We're talking the fossil record is from arid arid climates, Olduvai Gorge Desert. Have Bigfoot does not live in, remember that map? Arid climates, deserts that preserve fossils are not where they live. Now, if a creature dies in the forest, any of them, it immediately starts to decay at a precipitous rate. And there are no bones that are found. No one finds bones of bears or, or deer or elk or moose. They disappear immediately. I, I could go into some detail, but it's amazing how quickly animals, particularly in a, in a forest wet condition, how quickly <laughs> they began to disappear and deteriorating. I'll give you an example recently a possum died in my front yard. It was perfectly flat. Nature had totally decomposed that animal. It was flat like a pancake. All that was left was some fur and I could see the teeth. I even used a snow shovel to pick it up. Now this was done in a, a I mean, I got my, my front yard. It had to be done relatively quickly. It, you know, it just was like almost overnight. And I assure you, having had some experience with decomposition of animals, I'm a, it, it's amazing how quickly the process begins. But there's scavengers in the forest, and they're going to eat it up. You know, you, you, there were some things I was watching. Even before an animal dies, they were wondering how vultures knew there was dinner coming up. And the discussion was, how did they know a creature was going to pass away? And I've often been in the forest. I've seen uh, predator birds. And immediately you know that something had died in the woods mm -hmm. because they're circling above. And they're not there because they think it's scenic. They're waiting their turn. But those bones disappear. That, that, uh, that, that's an interesting uh, answer, really. Uh, so I, um, as I'm understanding it, the only, the closest to physical evidence there is, is these uh, plaster casts of footprints. That's the only physical thing there is, right? Right now, yes. That's why the hunters say they're doing performing a service. They want to go out and shoot a. They she want to shoot one. Well, you and one they'll say, your, oh, we'll give it. We'll give it to the scientists. One of your slide. One of your slides said a number of Bigfoot had been shot. What that was a phony. They they are making all sorts of claims. I just put that in there. I'm sorry, misleading you. I, I didn't have time, but oh yeah, we got one. Well, where is it, pal? And oh, they got their. I love this. They say we've got to shoot them to protect our families. Well, from what? That benign little guy, little creatures. <laughs> They're not out to bother anybody. That's what I mean. The passive speech. Oh, we've got to protect. Where's my gun? You know. They hear some noise, and all of a sudden they're grabbing their 
And then, you know, that's what I mean. They're making it impossible to go in the woods. I don't I, I just like hunters, man. Right. Okay. Yeah, they're making it impossible to go for a walk. They don't right. tell them they're going to plug you. Okay, I got a quick question. Then we'll go to Brian, and then we'll go to Justin. Charlie, I think I may have found uh, your recordings of Bigfoot. <laughs> <laughs> would you could would you consider that accurate representations of Bigfoot communication? The uh, well, okay. Seriously, <laughs> there's a lot of recordings out there. But if you ever, the one I played and the one everybody knows is called the Ohio Hall, Howl, H-O-W-L. Uh, there's Salt, Salt <clears throat> Creek Park in Ohio is considered a prime location of Big Feet. And the Ohio Hall, Howl, is regarded as a standard uh, recording. Now they have other ones that sound like chimps, like monkeys in the, you know, the zoo, uh, and that's those are hoaxers. <coughs> wow. Yeah. Okay, Brian. That's, that's Brian, a hoax. go ahead. <laughs> so I have two questions. You know, have you considered the possibility that the possum had been flat because it was stepped on by a Bigfoot? <laughs> uh, and that um, if the Bigfoot wants to be left alone, why don't you just leave him alone? Why don't you keep, why do you keep looking for him? I'll just, just leave him be. Thanks. Um, yeah, I, I totally agree with you. But they, you, you have to preserve the forest. Okay, Karina you... wants to go out there and chop the trees down. She says she needs paper for her pr computer printer. Uh -huh. um, yeah, prime, prime directive one. There's nothing wrong with establishing contact and communication with them. Maybe it's long overdue. We could. That's why I said, what are you gonna, what are you gonna tell them about ourselves? You know, you learn how to talk with them in their language. Say, hey, these are pretty good guys. You know. Yeah, they might sit down and you know they might even join the Libertarian Party. Who knows? Right, give give them a COVID vaccine and make sure they're protected. No, um, I, yeah, you're right. Leave nature alone. I agree with you. Uh, why I always say, why does it bother you? Just leave it alone. You know. Uh, hey, I, and I'm fine with that. I mean, leave leave the Bigfoot be. Uh, you know, if he's out there in the forest, not bothering anybody, just leave him alone. So you well, know, if he's figured out how to hide and and maybe then just leave them be, no need to look for them, you know? They, they have tried to pass legislation to make them an, an endangered species, um, such as the state of, was it Idaho, Oregon? If you shoot a Bigfoot, it's a thousand dollar fine and up to a year in jail. Hmm. So the intention was this would be necessary. There's been things introduced in Canada and certain states uh, to protect them from those hunters. Right, right. Because those guys are going to go out there and yeah, it, no doubt, you know, this is why Bigfoot doesn't show up in game cameras. Yeah. They, they, they don't want to get, they look at that and they stay away from it. You, you think the, the Bigfoots need government protection? Well, yeah, I, I don't think, I don't, <laughs> No, they need protection from us. Yeah. Okay. From those yahoos. Have a have a Bigfoot uh, bureau, like a Department of Bigfoot Affairs, in the federal government. Bunch of people getting a pension. <laughs> yeah. I'll work. I'll go to work for it. Well, the thing, the thing is, it's called a bureaucrats. Another, yeah. another, another species coming extinct. Yeah, I'll go. I'll take that job in the Department of the Interior. Make certain right. that everybody in the United States follows the rules. You're darn right. Right. They're all sufficiently educated about Bigfoot. Not put, not take some jamoke like you put you in jail for a year. Right. You know, the only place so where socialist you, magic is conducted. Yeah, go. that's a good idea. Oh, yeah, I like my yeah. All right. You want to go hunting? 
if I catch you with a gun in Bigfoot territory, <laughs> you know, it's a gun, gun like I said, socialist magicus. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, Justin, go ahead. Justin, uh, Tyler, go ahead. Hey, hey uh, first off, um, Tim, the, the more times you say uh, go ahead, the faster people unmute. Uh, so, Charlie, um, uh, you said that communism is self-evident. Could you elaborate on that a little bit, please? What, that cooperation is better than competition? Yeah. Wait. Sorry, go ahead. I didn't mean, sorry. I mean, that's how those species were able to live, uh, hunter and gatherers, by sharing food. <laughs> There's a hundred thousand years of evidence that the Tassidae obviously shared the food among each other and the community continued. Are you, did you miss, I guess you did miss the first part, that's right. But yes, through the, that's how the species were able to continue existing. Uh, so if, if. By foraging and sharing uh, food. Okay. Now, Bigfoot, Bigfoot also, I actually tell you, to tell you this, Bigfoot are predators in the sense that they are rumored to, to get deer and things like that. Um, but they will share that. They're not they're not gonna eat it but just by themselves. So so communism to you means cooperation and sharing. Yeah, of course. All right, I'm gonna for me I'm gonna, I'm gonna look. Ability, one guy's a good uh, some people are good at hunting, some at gathering. So they bring the food to the village and everybody has dinners. Hey, I say, hey, thanks, man. It'll be my turn tomorrow. Sounds okay. Thanks, Charlie. Right? You're welcome right. to join us. I'm sorry, join you where? What's that? You said j join us where? In the Communist Party. Do they got a libertarian communist faction? No. Or like a or a non uh you know non Marxist faction? Actually, or voluntarist faction? The they do have occasional classes, but I I have not they do not sit around all day and discuss doctrine. Oh they're they're mostly talk about current events like the college of complexes they, there's not marxism and all that you know uh well it does not once I'm in not a, a while communist, there was a class sound too appetizing to me once in a while there was a class but they don't discuss this arcane features of economies and it's basically you know current events you know yeah they're trying to uh, work them up funds so they can exist Lefty stuff, you know. Uh, yeah. So there's no there's no heavy doctrine, you know. Okay. Any more questions? Uh, Bob Matter, you haven't had any questions yet. You want to ask one real quick? Yeah, uh, Charlie. Um, these these big feet seem to be found in all different climates, uh, but I never hear about any evidence of any fires being seen that maybe Bigfoot started or anything like that. Are they, are you saying, are they not cook their food? Are they eating raw food? Are they vegans or what the hell, what the hell are they eating and are they cooking? And how are they staying warm in the cold climates? All right, you got a complex question there, Bob. Uh, no, I'm not aware personally of any evidence of Sasquatch using fire. Uh, number two, uh, they certainly consume meat. They have a high protein requirement. The big, 
the big, big specimens require a lot of protein. Now, I'm not a nutritionist, and I've seen the figures, but yes, you'd have to have a diet that would incorporate some meat, high protein, um, but they wouldn't cook it. None of the other animals in the forest cook their food, so why should they? I mean, they're doing okay. I never cooked my food for my cat. How do they stay warm? Uh, now, the other thing I was trying to explain was that, uh, well, number one, the Yeti, which I believe definitely exists, most assuredly. Um, the Yeti exists in the cold climate by, by going like the Indians did in the past. They had different camps. And the Yeti has different camps uh, below the tree line and above the tree line. Uh, how do they stay warm? There's some reason that they have, they can achieve some uh, hi hibernation. Uh, also, they're covered with fur, but uh, they may have reduced the nutritional needs during the winter. Uh, that's why. There are reports like, when are you most likely to see one? Uh, usually the springtime, you know. Granted, it's rough. I used to do a lot of, you know something? I used to do an awful lot. He was asking me, did you ever see one? I used to do an awful lot of winter camping. I would start my camping season around Easter before anybody else. Um, and I would encounter all kinds of animals. Yeah, it's tough, it's rough, but uh, they seem to make it, you know. That's what I'm, we'll know better if you had a specimen. Are they designed by, through evolution to, we can't answer that question now. You know, like bears, you can tell a bear is designed for winter. Yeah, there's, there's certain features that a bear's anatomy, the humans don't have. Bear's anatomy is different than ours. And I don't understand all of it. Uh, it's way beyond me, but they're particularly suited uh, uh, for winter conditions. Okay. You know, like animals do it. They grow fur. My cats even grow fur for winter. I mean, they don't go out. But they do maintain that attribute. They get they put on a thicker coat. You know. So even domestic animals retain those those features. You know. Does that answer it? I can't hear yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, I'd say it's that's satisfactory. Yeah, what do you do? What's that above your your window there? Antlers. Yeah. Yeah, what did you, did you kill it? No. Okay, Justin, you're next. You think animals should be a trophy, right? Well, um, that's uh, kind of how uh, how we how the, how we evolved. Um, the mighty, you know, the warriors. Uh, usually, the person who did the kill. In those in those halcyon tribal days you're talking about, the person that killed the animal that the tribe ate got to keep the the claws or the teeth or the antlers, and that was a status symbol. Oh matter, yeah. Matter of fact, he didn't even generally the uh, the tribal hunter that, that that killed the big game. He didn't even have to carry it back. They would go back to the to the uh, to the camp, and then the women would go out and pick up the antelope or the deer or whatever oh, it was. where did you get that bullshit? From <laughs> a theory, theory of the leisure class by Thurston Vebler. The only thing I will tell you about that is a lot of people don't realize is that uh, the Indians, like, why did they just have uh, hunting and gathering? Is that the, it's been, they've done analysis of this, that the Indians maybe worked one day a week they went out hunting one day 
and that was enough food for the whole week. So yeah, why why would they abandon? Yep. And the, and the big culture is a lot of work. That's the, the opposite. Like I spoke on that. Said the warriors, the warriors got the spoils. They got the furs. They got the teeth, the claws, the horns. Those oh, all status people. And then when they when they would fight another tribe and defeat them, what do you think they got? That's they not. Got there's no. The Indians they didn't the break women, them. The women were their, the women were, their no, were like no. their slaves. They, you don't they, understand uh, Indian regalia. They didn't wear. They. You might have one guy who wear bear claws, and that's it. They didn't incorporate that in their costumes. They like colors. No. What are you talking about? Well, you got to look at all kinds of tribal societies, not just American Indians, but tribes. I'm talking on a global basis. No, this is they used to brag. Indians do. Status. You're talking about an Indian bragging on his exploits. That was in two locations. One, the entrance to his team. How many questions do people get? Um, you can have as many as you want. There are two places where an Indian would brag. That was the entrance to his teepee, uh, his feather in his cap, and the other place was his horse. They would decorate his horse, and you could read a horse and see what this guy's exploits were. Like if you saw this guy's horse, you might think twice about getting in a fight with him. You know, if it said, like, kill 10 settlers, you know, you might say, well, I let this guy through, you know. All right. But no, they didn't wear this stuff. Okay. Justin, go ahead. So, Charlie, you had early, you had earlier uh, agreed that, you know, communism means cooperation and sharing. I just did a quick word search through the um, Samuel Moore translation of the Manifesto of the Communist Party, the word sharing does, does not appear once. The word share appears once, but not in the context of like sharing things. And the word cooperation does not exist in the uh, Communist Manifesto. So is Marx and Engels wrong or, um, or are... Or is communism, you know, is or is saying that communism is just means you're sharing and cooperating a more, you know, sort of, uh, I guess I am obtuse definition of communism. You you didn't look up the definition. You did a word search, but you didn't look up. The guy wrote a whole book on what it is. Currently, you, I'm yeah. actually, I've, I'm Did researching this it? for my debate. He wrote books. He wrote a whole library on what it is. Did you do a word search of Marxism? It no, I'm looking whole, within the Communist Manifesto, which defines what communism page. is. Am I wrong? Did you do a word search? You, did you do a word search of Marxism? <laughs> Come on. So you had in, no in a word spoke. search in Wait the Communist Manifesto so you the word in Marxism. One place. You looked at you picked out where to look, when to look, where to look, and you didn't find something. So that I'm supposed to accept this. Try again. I, I would man. Charlie, I would I would assume <laughs> that if if communism read, means read sharing and communism means cooperation, then yeah. Marx and Engels would have had the lot read to what, say about it in the was. actual manifesto. Did you did you look at anything written by the CPUSA? Did you read anything on socialism? I've read lots of things about socialism, and um, you know, like you don't need a revolution, and you don't need a, or you know to take over the government to share things and cooperate with people. So I don't I don't understand why in the Communist Manifesto they called for all these reforms, much of, many of which the United States have taken on. Um, if, if, if it's just cooperating and sharing, why do we need, you know, why do we need for the to government to take over education and, and the roads and 
and communications and uh, you know labor and all that sort of thing. Because one percent of the people have privilege. Do you encourage? Do you accept privilege, right? So, so communist. So we so need like the government privilege. to take over. So you like? You we like need. We, we, well, why do we? I just, there's communist fe fellows in uh, already, or your so-called socialist states. I can't believe this. There's privilege. The privilege of the one percent versus you never heard of the ninety-nine percent, Bill. Yeah, so we I have. Heard all this stuff. Yeah, we have. Things are different in the forest, man. And the species yeah. that cooperate survive. I proved that. No winner. Yes. Well, humans yeah. cooperate no all the time. And they I don't prove that. Water. It's, it's called trade. evolution itself. My entire talk was proof of communism. It's called trade. It's called mutual aid. It's called charity. Yeah. You don't you don't need uh you don't need any voluntary action that's that's cooperative. Or that is a you know a sharing is yeah you don't have to do anything for anybody else you don't have don't, to do I never no I'm not saying you don't I, have to do anything for any other creature in the woods yeah that you have to do, no little, where are you getting you this Charlie the, he doesn't understand how does the butcher does he how does the butcher get his dinner you know there are and males Smith. males they that do are it. they do it for their own like self interest and serve others. Do you think the, the rogue male running around the woods by himself, excluded from the, that's the ideal condition? No. No, when did I say that? That's ridiculous. We didn't. When did I say that, we, Charlie? Well, that's what you're advancing. No, it's no, not uh -huh. what we're advancing. He doesn't have any obligations. Charlie, when did I out. say that we have to go out in the woods and have no obligations? When did I say that? Trade. Between tribes, there's trade. You're trying to present arguments against cooperation. No, I'm not. I'm saying no, that. Not. I'm, yes, I'm I did. Not. I did a word. I'm saying. I'm saying. Why do we need government revolution, or why do we? Why do we need revolution, or why do we need to why have the government need revolution? Because the people in power, uh, you know, what do you do? Just go to them and say, "Hey, uh, do you mind if we?" Kind of share power and resources. What if they say I don't feel like it? People already share power. Like people it, people already share resources and stuff already without without voluntarily. Mm -hmm. They don't. They don't need. They don't need yeah. a communist party to take over the government. And yeah, you know, does it not count or something? I'm, I'm and, understanding why the boss how. And the owner, Justin, yes, you're looking at a species called socialist magicus. Why don't you go to the owner of the company or that boss and say, hey, you guys are keeping all the wealth. Can we, the employees, have some? And they're going to say, oh, yeah, okay. How much do you guys want? Is that what happens? What? I go you to my do, boss like, uh, you know. Just, ask, just go, talk, go see the boss and everything will be perfect, right? My yes, boss like already. gives me my my boss like you know matches uh my contributions to my four hundred one k and oh you know, how so nice of them he doesn't give you a guaranteed annuity retirement <laughs> why doesn't he provide the retirement total contribute to your oh how nice of him thank you sir so so he, he doesn't give me an annuity so therefore hey, when like, I retired. Do other the companies give annuities? Provided. Don't you know that employers provide retirement? There is another world. Hey, Charlie, you can't have it both ways. You can't say that the boss doesn't give anything and then right out of your mouth two seconds later say that they offer benefits. That's your, 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 you self, you contradict yourself, right? Do, 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 do you get benefits from the boss? Do, there was do workers get benefits from, for their, for, from their employers? There was a girl in my unit that went to the boss. Yes or no? And said, I would like either I get paid more money or I'm leaving. And he listened to her. He didn't say anything. Then he looked up at her and he said, I'll press the elevator button for you to go. So what does that have to do? So you're going to pick one no, example gonna of a got you. No, gonna gonna make, that's called anecdotal evidence, Charlie. That's not that's not <laughs> proof of anything. 
you you use the most fallacious arguments. No wonder why communism and uh, Lee. is such That's a what he told me. And you Lee. know and what is it? Socialist happened. magicus. Why does it only socialist magicus have? They have the most impaired reason faculties <laughs> ever. They don't you know how to. They, people. Hopefully say, soon, socialist magicus will be extinct. This is what they decided yeah. to give you, and you say thank you, sir. Thank you. So is that is that what you do at your is that what they do at your job, Charlie? Well, we don't take doggy treats. So so either they do or they don't, Charlie. Pick one. <laughs> Pick one. You, you you're you're contradicting yourself, dude. You, you, <laughs> you make the, the worst guy. arguments ever. <laughs> I do. I met you guys. I didn't realize I was so incapable of achieving any argumentation. I'm learning. Oh. I'm practicing. Please forgive me <laughs> for being incompetent and responding to nonsense. Uh, it, it, well, it's because you're spouting off nonsense, Charlie. Oh. Socialist magicus does not exist. Okay, Brian, go ahead. So knowing what you know about Bigfoot, do you think that in Bigfoot culture, <laughs> do you think <laughs> that... Uh, you know, maybe if American players adopted more Bigfoot Sasquatch-esque uh, policies, that we'd have a more fair and equitable system. Thanks. Well, I, I'm not certain. <laughs> or, <laughs> what, what a Bigfoot employment policy would be. They, they don't seem to work themselves, so they don't have factories, that's for sure. How but yes, know? they have developed a means of survival and it's survival without exploitation. And it's been going on for thousands of years and they're spreading across the earth like socialism. They've spread. If, if, their, if their lifestyle wasn't any good, they would have joined the, the extinct species. But did you see the map where well, they're everywhere? Yeah, it's true. <laughs> so that's what I'm saying. Be like them and the yeah. species will, will flourish. And so spread. people could be like on the payroll. Like socialism. But nobody would ever see them. You know, they wouldn't know they were there. Isn't that called ghost payrolling that goes on in Chicago all the time? Imagine that every one of those little animals on the map was a guy like me spreading socialism. And getting a check. Yeah. And no one ever sees him. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thanks. All right, Justin, go ahead. He's back. Charlie, uh, uh, how do we know about the anthropological... Uh, nature and and how bigfoot society works when uh there's uh been no documented evidence um very easy of, very easy of, of any there's no been observation of of you know uh, bigfoot in the wild uh, in a, on a long you know on a long-term basis there's several disciplines and i've studied them academically Good. and i've enjoyed them I was going to major in each of these topics. One is a subject called sociology. Two is a subject called anthropology. And uh, the third one is a subject called comparative psychology, in which is comparison of various species, uh, as, to, as the word say. So yes, that's how we know. Now, they are animals, primates. I don't perceive why they would suddenly, I told you, don't get into that woo-woo that there's some strange, strange creatures. They're just like everybody else. And they comply to the same laws of nature and society as every other creature. How's that? Okay, I think it might be time for uh, rebuttals now, if anybody doesn't have any more questions. Who's going to rebut this? What are we... 
I think maybe uh, we could start working on the uh, rebuttal of the species <coughs> uh, socialist magicus and, and talk about that a little bit more. You All know. right, are we transitioning into rebuttals? I think so. Everybody agree at this point, the transition into rebuttals? Any more questions? Come on, yeah. guys. Is I that guess your just, best shot? No, yeah. Okay, Charlie, I'll, I'll, I'll get you up with one more here. Uh, right. on, this, on the topic of uh, forests and, you know, sustainability and everything like that, I was just looking at a chart that showed uh, that we had, uh, oh, gosh, uh, uh, one, 1. 1.6 million illegal aliens came in between October 21 and March 22. That's look, using the, the government's fiscal year of October as a, as a starting. In 2021, it was 1.7 million. Uh, how long can we keep having a sustainable system when we're bringing in like a, basically a large city worth of people every year? We're, we're creating a, you know, a new, uh, another Chicago or another, you know, is this Indianapolis. A, is this us a challenge me? Yeah, I mean, what? Uh, I mean, right. you know, these, these people are going to need housing. They're going to need lumber. They're going to need toilet paper. Uh, all right, all right. Yeah. yeah, I know everybody needs it, and we're willing to share with them. But I believe the workforce for the United States, you can use any figure you want, Bob, but I think it's around 240 million. One million or a million and a half out of 240 is called legally, your lawyer pals would know this term, de minimis. D-I-M-I-N, de minimis. It's of no significance. That change in the workforce on any given day are 10 times that many, voluntary and involuntary changes to the workforce. So, I mean, well, you're we're change. adding to the population, though. This is not just a change. Rate as well. All these, all these people have to eat and and be uh, clothed and fed and uh, you know have health care. They're going to generate garbage. How many tons of garbage do uh, the two million people generate a year? Are you kidding? Given the waste on 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 luxury goods in the United States. Cut down on luxury goods, and you could have 10, 10 million. Guys need yachts. They need lumber for yachts, right? That's what I heard tonight. The yachts oh. were a, a mansion. They need oh, lumber you know, for a mansion. Charlie, I got, one last, I got one uh, last question for you, you Charlie. Know, good to see you. You advocate, as, as part of the species of socialist magicus, you're advocating no more lumber. No more oil pipelines, get back to the environment. Isn't what you're then going to do basically put us all back in the forest? What's wrong with that? Why do you think I spent so much time in the forest? Are you, are you against being one with nature? I'm I'm one much with nature. Why would I go to a forest voluntarily? I traveled around the United States, up and down the Appalachian Trail. Burning carbon at the to same be, time, right, Charlie? To, live, to enjoy nature, a natural life, in harmony with nature. Then why you aren't might, you there and still living you, in your you apartment not venturing you out? You can't, have you ever been on a forest on a beautiful spring day? Yes, I have. And I'm also very so. glad to leave it and what come home want? and take you a shower. The of, you want the lights of Broadway or something? I don't know. I mean, what Char are you talking about? You can, have a low, you can have a low consumption lifestyle. It's possible. You can reduce your carbon footprint. That's no problem. The only hope for the world, Charlie, is a thorium-based molten salt reactor. You're telling no, me opulence. Oh my just, God, we can't allow, we all, oh, we, people can't have opulence. 
I just read the average. Is this terrible? I just read that the average person uh, generates 4.4 pounds of garbage per day. What? So that's like, uh, that's, uh, that is, uh, well, I lost my number now, but that's something that's, that's like, uh, you know, like seven and a seven and a half million tons of trash a year. Actually, it's all packaging. And I actually have done a study of packaging because in printing, when I was in printing business, we printed packaging, soup can labels and stuff like that. Yeah, that's what your that's what your waste is. And I must admit, I was involved in the industry. I designed a I still go to supermarkets. I look at the design of the the labels and see which ones are good, which ones are bad. Yeah. But that's packaging. So you look for the union label, right, Charlie? No, no, I he's saying that. I'm just saying that packaging is there's a whole actually some very interesting books. You know, yeah. why things are packaged the way they are. All right, let's move on now to rebuttals. Um I'd assume that some of you guys, Justin, Brian, Bob, you guys are going to give you five minutes. Can you think you can be up to the challenge to uh, rebut Charlie or the uh, socialist magicus species that we're talking about tonight? Yeah, I think so. All right, Justin, I'm going to give you five minutes. You think you you think you're up for the challenge, Brian? Yes, yes, I'm up. All right, Brian. <laughs> Bob, how about you? Guys, thank me for my speech. Yeah, I'll probably yeah we'll thank you Charlie. for your speech, Charlie. Right, thank Let's you thank for Charlie for his speech. Thank All right, you so for we got Justin, we got Bob. Thank you, Charlie. We have Brian. Uh, how about you, Steve? You want to try it? Oh, I don't think I'll rebut. Okay, so we got three rebutters. How about I give you guys each uh, yeah, about five minutes? So. Uh, Melanie, what do you think? You want to give it a shot or uh, you're uh, but just kind of want to sit there and listen for a little bit? But she's probably still with us. But anyway, just glad to see you're still sticking around. Vicki, anything you want to say? Yeah. Uh, and you want to try a rebuttal? I don't have tonight? anything to rebut, really. I'm okay. sorry Margaret missed this. I think it might have been the trolls last time. That uh, yeah, I think it may have been. Yeah, All right, we'll, let Charlie, we'll let Charlie get the last word in. Okay, I'm going to be uh, give you guys about five minutes, but it's going to be a lenient five minutes. So uh, I got Justin, Bob, Brian, and then Charlie's the last word. Steve, did you want to try to give it give it a shot too? I don't think so, no. Okay. Justin, go ahead. You got six, seven minutes. All right, so... Um, thanks, Charlie. I, I'll have to catch the rest of this on YouTube. Um, uh, I, if of all the uh, crypto zoological creatures that possibly could exist, I think Bigfoot is probably the most likely to exist. Um, however, I don't, I don't considering there's lack of any sort of documentation of its existence. I am going to uh, probably um, guess that it does not exist. Um, however, I'd like to see some evidence. Uh, you know, if if you know, if I would love to be. I would love there for there to be a you know a species of ape to be discovered uh, that is walking around uh, the forests and the wild uh, lands of the world. Uh, but I just don't you know, probably, uh, probably likely just does not exist. Uh, socialist magicist, uh, or magicus, uh, which I think Charlie belongs to that species. Um, so uh, yeah, I, I, I don't buy this notion that communism is just sharing and cooperation. I mean, if it was just that, then like, why did we have to have a manifesto written about it? And why did, you know, uh, if it's just so self-evident that it's just sharing, then 
I don't know, why does Marx have to write, you know, a thousand page book on it? I don't know. I, I think it's a silly little semantic trick that communists like to pull. Uh, everybody's a communist. Duh, uh, uh. Um, which is ridiculous because, um, you know, people who, <laughs> most people, you know, mom and dad share with their children, you know, families share all the time, you know, people belong to communities that provide mutual aid to each other. Um, even, even vo voluntary transactions, um, between, uh, you know, two or more parties uh that's all sharing in some certain degrees so i mean i yeah this notion that it's share yeah that's just silly to me i don't i think it's a horrible argument i think that um if communism was about sharing and communism was just about cooperation then uh, marx and engels would have a lot more to say about it in the manifesto um and then of course you know uh a, a pushback against that that would be well you have to read all of marx oh yeah I'll, yeah i need to read all of it to be able to make a critique about it and i have to read all of yeah yeah i don't need to read all of that to know that communism is not just sharing and not just cooperation so yeah and then as as demonstrated by charles earlier the straw men the the uh you know the cherry picking and the um you know self-contradictory sort of <laughs> things that he says um uh it's a, it's an illogical worldview that these uh socialist magicus uh folks this crypto uh zoological creature that that i don't think is crypto i think it's an actual species um so you know i hope maybe maybe charlie can do a presentation on on socialist magicus uh, in the future <laughs> And I think it would be a wonderful presentation because um, I, I, it's 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 I, I learned a lot about Charlie today because you know I, I know Charlie just from a lot from you know being like a labor guy and in in a socialist uh, magicus and the college you know he's really into the college and he takes the college seriously but it's good to, it's good to learn more about Charlie about you know, especially his his fascination with Bigfoot I I it's you know, it adding more dimension to the Charlie, you know, like <laughs> I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm interested to see what other sort of non-political topics, uh, Charlie, uh, is into other than Bigfoot. So yeah, thanks Charlie for the presentation. Uh, but I, I, I think that you're, you're, you're wrong, you know, like oh, oh, co cooperation and sharing is, oh, oh, oh. Th yeah. And, and I have a feeling the commie preacher is going to use similar sort of arguments in, uh, in, in our debate, which is happening June 11th. And I think all you guys should come. I actually think that um, we should do more of an Oxford style thing. Uh, motion. Jesus was a communist. Uh, and then uh, Reverend Arp can argue in the positive. I'll argue in the negative. And then we can have like a take polling before and after the debate and see who wins you know that way we can have like a uh, a definitive sort of like who wins the debate um and regarding trolls i certainly hope that there was some measures that were taken to um to admin you know help administer uh and run smooth meetings so uh don't feel too bad tim because i i've had similar experiences uh, hosting Libertarian Party events where I've had trolls jump in and um, it got really overwhelming and frustrating, but I did, was able to, uh, we never had the problem since and hopefully that continues with the college. Um, Charlie, again, sharing cooperation. Oh my gosh. <laughs> oh. Okay. Yeah. 
All right, I've got Brian, and then I got Bob. Who? Which one of you? I, I, I'm sorry, I got Brian, and then I got Bob. Which one of you wants to go next? Hey, Bob can take it. Okay. okay. Bob, go ahead. What? All right. So, um, we we got briefly here in a little bit about uh, status seeking when we were talking about uh, antlers and claws and stuff. And yeah, contrary to what Charlie was telling you, uh, go go look at any photographs. Uh, and there's been many of them made, you know, of American Indians back, you know, before the turn of the century. And they're always well appointed with all kinds of necklaces of shells and beads and teeth and things like that. And, uh, you know, other ornate, you know, things. Uh, and again, this also went on in, you know, other tribal societies like, like in Africa, you know, same thing. Uh, the hunter would get the, the horns, you know, the one that struck the final blow, if it was a, you know, big tiger or something, the guy who delivered the coup de gras would, you know, he'd be awarded with the teeth and maybe some of the other guys on the hunt would maybe get some claws or something like that. Uh, or the skin, you know, to wear. And uh, as, as these hunters, uh, you know, as the top ones, you know, came to the forefront, and then they also, that also kind of carried into the warrior class when they would fight other tribes. Same thing when, uh, when they would, uh, when, when they were victorious, the, the, uh, the warriors who led the battle or killed the most uh, members of the other tribe or whatever, they were rewarded and often rewarded with wit captured women. So they would, you know, generally capture the women and children of the other tribe, one they just annihilated and bring those back with them. And uh, the children would be raised as members now of the, of the victorious tribe. The women would be uh, kept into slavery, gen generally going to the chief and then these women would create wealth for the chief. They, you know, they would make baskets, they would gather food, they would cook, and of course also provide sex at the chief's will. And uh, when the chief would come to favor one over all the other ones, then his, some of his status would basically rub off on her. So then other people in the tribe would treat her with, you know, deference because, you know, she's sleeping with the boss. So you don't want to get her mad. And pretty soon the way this, the way this evolved, then the, uh, you know, they were the, 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 the chief's favorite wives, you know, they would get nice clothes to wear. They would, it turns out then they would, they wouldn't have to do labor anymore. Other, other ones would do the labor and, uh, and they were, so they were given all this, you know, you know, preferential treatment and, because we are a people that likes to mimic uh, what our peers are doing, the other, the lesser people in the tribe would would see this, and then they would want to mimic that, and this is what gave rise to marriage. So then they would then uh, take on a uh, a bride, basically, so they could be like like the chief. It was sort of like a, a status thing. And this is, this is how marriage came along. Now, we, we advanced this, you know, some several hundred years. And we look in the, like, in the Southern culture, in the Civil War South, and you see these, the women of the plantation, the wives of the plantation owners, wearing these gargantuan uh, skirts, dresses. And they would start wearing uh, high heel shoes and, have their hair done and all that. And again, this is all, you know, status driven. So when you saw them walking down the street, you knew that they were not maids or field workers. You know, you knew that these were women that had some, uh, you know, had some dough and had a, uh, you know, some wealth behind them and they were married to a powerful rich man. Uh, and so this is how, this is how, uh, high heels became kind of a, a popular thing. So, when, so even in it, so when, even when you saw, you know, in modern days, when you see a woman walking down the street, 
with high heel shoes on and nylons, you know, you knew that she was, you know, working in an office somewhere probably uh, or something like that. And you knew that she was not on her hands and knees scrubbing floors or anything like that. So this all became, you know, this is all, you know, a status symbol. And of course, the men like, like the status, you know, and you go, you look at other, other items uh, in our culture, um, you, know, you know, we could all get by using a, you know, a wooden spoon to eat with, but then uh, somebody wants to show their status. So they want a, a, a silver spoon. And then the next guy wants to have a golden spoon. The next guy wants a platinum spoon. And then the next guy wants a platinum spoon with, with a diamond in it. And then the next guy wants a whole a spoon encrusted with diamonds and emeralds. You know, and again, this is all to uh, to show their status, uh, you know, for everybody else. And uh, so the, anyway, I highly recommend reading uh, The Theory of the Leisure Class by uh, Thurston Veblen. He gets into to all that. So what great. about the people who don't have anything to eat? They don't have any soup to consume. And you think socialism's going to provide it? No. Well, no, they, yeah, they, uh, you know, decorative spoons. People don't, they got spoons they don't have any need for because they don't have food. Well, yeah, that's the, uh, that's, that's true, Charlie. That's survival of the fist. <laughs> All right. Okay. Uh, that's the way Brian. it is. All right. Brian, you ready? Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Brian, let's uh, give Charlie a, let, let's give socialist magic as his comeuppance tonight. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's just like the difference between libertarians and commies. You know, it's like, you know, leave leave Bigfoot alone, right? I mean, if he exists, he's out in the forest, you ain't bothering nobody, don't bother him. Don't go looking for him. Don't try to inject him with COVID, the COVID vaccine. You don't try to hunt him for his own protection. I mean, it, it's like, you know, it, it's like this is the kind of, you know, it's like this stark contrast between the libertarians and, and the communists where it's like, you just can't leave well enough alone. You know, I mean, if he's out there, he's not bothering anybody. Why you got to bother him, man? You like, you got to go out there and, and you want to, you know, like harm him for his own protection. I, I mean, it's just like, that is such a commie thing to do, man, you know? And, and you know, whereas if it's just from my perspective, like, I don't know if Bigfoot exists or not, but I know he doesn't want to be bothered. So I'm not out there looking for him. You know, like, what, what's up, Charlie? Why don't you just leave well enough alone, man? You know, because Karl Marx told you otherwise. And Karl Marx uh, told you, you got you to go bothering everybody, you know, <laughs> even Bigfoot. I, you know, <laughs> so that's all right. That's it. Steve, you want to get in and get in on this a little bit or not? Well, I, I don't know what uh, what side of it to uh, address, the political side or the crypto side. On so the crypto... Just, just, hmm? Let's go ahead and talk away for a few minutes, Steve. Let's hear what you got to say. Well, on the crypto zoology side, uh, I, uh, as I understand it, there's no physical evidence, whatever, for the existence of uh, Bigfoot. Uh, Charlie said that the bones rot in climatic conditions of forest, uh, but this Yeti is supposedly uh, running around in the snow. Where, where are the Yeti bones? Uh, I think there'd be, if the, if the thing existed as a branch of, uh, either uh, ape or human lineage, there'd be abundant physical evidence of it. Uh, and the DNA would have said something. So uh, I'm not convinced. I'd love to uh, believe uh, such things. Who wouldn't? Uh, but I, I don't think there's, uh, there's evidence for the existence of these cryptos. On the uh, political side, I think uh, if people want to talk about the manifesto, they should read it. Uh, and I, I would point out that uh, since Frederick Engel was uh, 
referred to. Engel wrote a whole Engels wrote a whole book on the subject that Charlie was discussing. Uh, his thesis is contentious, is not uh, universally accepted among anthropologists, but he argues for what he calls primitive communism uh, as the state of humankind for most of its biological history. The book, and it's a wonderful book, is called The Origin of the Family, Private Property, and the State. And anybody that wants to uh, critique Marxism, at least they should read the fundamental uh, angles. And of course, as I said, if, if we're going to discuss the Communist Manifesto, which is all about class, it's all about class, then I think uh, I think it's I think it's a short thing, by the way. Somebody said it was a thousand pages. You can read the Communist Manifesto in an hour, and it's about the class structure of capitalism. I would recommend it. Uh, it was a book that changed my life utterly. Uh, I must say, though, that I'm not a communist uh, because there isn't a communist party uh, that that I actually see as capable of uh, building socialism in the United States. But that is probably a conversation for another uh, night. Okay, I'm going to take a quick stab at this myself. And it's just that, uh, you know, Charlie, you know, one of the reasons... Uh, you know, one of the things in the not so distant past, people didn't work hard, but not for the reasons I historical or socialist think. There were no happy peasants laboring a few hours in the fields and spending the rest of the day in leisure. They were starving and had no energy to work hard. Far from being an idyllic life, watching one's children suffer from malnutrition and being too weak is a hellish experience. Basically, 200 years ago, some 20% of the inhabitants of England and France could not work at all. At most, they had enough energy for a few hours of slow walking per day, which condemned most of them to a life of begging. With the beginnings of the culture of the agricultural revolution, the trap began to fall apart. Per capita incomes began to grow, perhaps for the first time in history, when there was a steady possibility of improving nutrition. Better nutrition enabled people to grow bigger and stronger, which further enabled productivity to increase, setting a positive synergy between improvements in income and improvements of health, each feeding off of each other. Capitalism has produced a cornucopia of all around us, but a uh, socialist magicist has to believe that uh, the government is being run everything. Individuals and socialist magicists ignorant of economics and history believe today's corner corpy has always been it is understandable why they may be enamored with their favorite democratic socialists believing they will get their corner copia. they dream of obtaining even more as a socialist government seizes wealth passes seized wealth onto them perhaps they dream of the world promised by socialists where they have to work less the democratic socialist jacobin magazine argues we may work too many hours and blames capitalism for the problem. They wonder how they would we would they how would we organize our time differently if we were free from the man capitalism. The thing is, is that capitalism has made work good. Contrary to mythology, 19th century factory jobs weren't great jobs. Today's jobs are even better. Uh, an English girl worked 14 hours a day in a farm. It was like heaven to me when I stayed to the town of Leeds and put in a contract industry. The move from the farm to a better life in the factory was true in America, too. I'll tell you the story of Lucy Larcom, a 19th century American poet who, at age 11, out of economic necessity, worked in the textile mills of Lowell's, Massachusetts. In Lucy's book, A New England Girlhood, she writes of her experience in the mill. In the mill, she encountered other poets, singers, writers, and who, like her, were hungry for education and eagerly attended the Lyceum lectures of the day. She couldn't have imagined America, a much higher standard of living with fewer mill workers and more people pursuing their dreams. Yet she was keenly aware her world was already changing. Things like that look miraculous. 
to her parents were commonplace to her. Our attitude, the attitude of the time, look, wrote Laura Carmel was, was that of children climbing their dooryard fence to watch an approaching show and to conjecture what more remarkable spectacle could be following behind. And the thing is, Charlie, you know, we look at over 300 years, you know, everybody was a peasant. Everybody was starving, except for maybe your royal, royal 1% rich. Now, almost everybody in the world is at least is getting a standard of living. There's been a 19, there, there's only like in 1991, about 25% of the world lived in abject poverty. Now we're down to 19%. Despite COVID mm -hmm. and some of the other things that we've had come upon us, the economy is starting to rebound. Um, certain, certain things are going, except for a damn dictator who is uh, trying to do everything down for his own egomaniac. I think our world has gotten, gotten to be a lot better place to trade in capitalism. And I would think that socialist magicus, I hope, will soon be an extinct species. Thank you very much. I'm done. Well done. Is that it? Nobody else? Anybody yeah, else? The towel, huh? Vicky, you I want to try? Yeah. Wanna... I, I, I Go ahead, wanted... Vicky. Sure. I kind of wanted to respond to what Tim just said, because my mother, when I, my dad would sometimes insult her uh, for being a, a Slovak. And then I asked, well, why, what are Slovaks like, you know? And she said, oh, he's right. They're just illiterate peasants. And she said, the Czechs, if anything, are the um, educated ones. And so I looked up Slovaks, illiterate peasants, and yeah, that was said a lot. And it said they work 12 hours a day, seven days a week, and they still, they, they were still horribly malnourished. They didn't have enough to eat. And it was so damn depressing uh, for my father and mother to be, I guess, too, for my father and mother to be right about that. Um, there were some other things I, 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 I found the topic interesting, not that I really care whether there's a Bigfoot or not, but I am interested in anthropology and I thought it was kind of a nice change for a while there until <laughs> it was brought back to politics. I, I like a refreshing change for me anyway. And I also enjoyed Bob Matter's contributions on status. Um, I remembered we had this adopt a family at the Ethical Humanist Society. Um, and that was so people in, who weren't very well off could have something for the holidays. And so they asked for things like matching towels and a remote for their television. And my girlfriend said, what's with the matching towels? And I even <laughs> shared with the therapist, my, my girlfriend said, I can't afford matching towels. Why should I, why should I buy them for this family? And, and I think people can be pretty damn poor and actually still care about status. It's kind of counterintuitive, but I, I think <laughs> it's the case. And I am done. <laughs> okay. Well, th Vicki, thank you. Anybody else real quick before Charlie gets the last word? Okay, Charlie, uh, you got the last word tonight. All right, I want to thank everyone for coming. And I hope you've gone from point A to point B and your understanding of a number of subjects. So, as I indicated, cryptozoology encapsulates multiple disciplines. And the study of it, I think, would defeat others. Uh, I wouldn't say it defeated all of you, but I'll go and turn. I don't know why, Justin, you there, sir? Why are you having such a hard time denouncing altruism, sharing and caring for another? It's called ethics. You want survival of the fittest? Well, let me give you an example of what, sir, goes on in nature. 
There's a bird that sees an eagle coming. And he squawks. And he warns the flock. And they're all able to escape. And as a result, uh, he may get eaten himself. But that's what goes on. The Darwin had some problems with altruism because it was evidenced in nature. And I don't perceive why you are opposed to it. It's utilitarian. It works. It improves the opportunities, the chances of survival. When did I denounce altruism? Well, yeah, you, you say you're trying to present an argument against sharing. I When did uh, I, I never present an argument against sharing. I made an argument that communism does not equal sharing. Communism does not mean sharing or cooperation. Right, that's whatever, what I was right. arguing. I guess that's I not the same thing. That's here. called a straw man. That's a defect in your reasoning. There's all you guys have on this. And all right, I'll leave it at that. I guess I was wrong, but uh, I'll stand corrected. Um, also, don't don't conclude with a yes by construction. I noticed that. That's not saying anything. All right, that takes care of Justin. Let's see, Bob Matter. Bob, I've been to so many powwows, it's unbelievable. Go to the Gathering of Nations. I've gone to the Gallup, New Mexico, the Indian capital for powwows. I Milwaukee across Wisconsin. Uh, uh, even in the ones in Chicago, of course, uh, looked at all sorts of Indian artifacts and attire. And the Indians, actually, I've also been to stores where they make up their powwow costumes. And there's none of this stuff that you were talking about. About the only thing I was seriously, I was thinking you can buy an eagle feather and they hold it as a fan when they dance. But I have no idea what the rest of you are talking about. It's like decorative things. Um, and this thing about Indians having slaves, there's no evidence of that. On occasion, they would take a captive, but it was to replace someone who may have died or died in battle. Now they may not have treated them as an equal. They didn't, I don't even say they treated them as slaves, but the concept was somehow to make up for loss. And that's about it. Otherwise they killed you. I mean, certain tribes were very dangerous. I'm serious, they were, they wouldn't, they didn't keep slaves such as the Iroquois. And the Iroquois were, were, were standalone, but they didn't, they didn't take captives. And they're certainly not slaves. Um, on occasion, uh, the Western movies would like to present the things where people are taken captive and that John Wayne movie or something. But, uh, no, that's not the case. There's no. Well, I think I think Thorsten Veblen was talking more about African tribes. You know, thing tribes that were earlier than American than uh, North American Indians. I have no knowledge of what African tribes do, nor do I think anybody else does. Um, the uh, anyhow, but they they just like colorful things, and there's no. I've never heard anything in status in an Indian costume. That's just not the case. There's none of, nothing like that. Uh, that's not the purpose of, it's more the craftsmanship of the, the maker. The, I mean, I knew people that went to the beat were did these and no, it's a demonstration of craftsmanship. Okay, that takes care of Bob. Uh, my friend Brian, I said merely that people who are unvaccinated 
should not go into the forest because they pose a threat to Bigfoot, which makes perfect sense to my mind. That's what I stated. Now, he may have missed it, but I talked for an hour and I purpose of the talk, Ryan, are you there? Yeah, I'm listening. <laughs> I said, we have to preserve the forest. Now, why would we want to preserve the forest? Oh, yes, I'll give you. So we could leave them alone, but we are not. People come along like them evil lumberjacks and they chop down the place where the Bigfoot lives. It makes him homeless. The purpose of the talk was in fact to leave them alone, give them their own land, leave them their own principality to their own government. That's the purpose of it. We are the ones who are intruding to Bob, to Tim's oil wells and pipelines and fracking and thorium mines and suburbs. And, and I all think this, it would do, Jay, would do, would give us a boom. Heaven. What? Would give us a boom that would be unprecedented and we could fulfill our and clean up the environment as well. We're taking away their habitat. Anyhow, that's basically it. And let's see who's left here. Anyhow, take care of that guy. Uh, <laughs> last of all, Tim, I've been through the mills in Massachusetts, and there is not a place you want to work. Are you for real? And you say that's it would be it was certainly if it if it was a choice between Tim, a farm Tim, and a mill. Most of those girls went deaf from the machinery. I was only at I was only at one demonstration factory, and they had one machine operating, and it hurt my ears when I got out afterwards. And there were a hundred of them. Do you imagine what the sound was? was like when they were all operating. Like I, I said, that's why OSHA time, came I noticed that even when I left, I said, boy, was that something I experienced it. The sound, yeah. the deafening sound. And, and now the they're working and uh, people don't work there anymore. Dangerous job occupation where there's things flying and spinning. And you tell me this is ideal occupation. Now no, the, I never said it was ideal, but they do move up. And, and I don't know what you're talking about, peasants. The peasants weren't wandering around. I'll tell you why, because for the most part, we discussed this last week. They were I got you off getting coffee because we discussed how the land, you were owned by the land. Peasants came with the land. So if you bought a piece of property, you got a bunch of peasants. And that's the way it was in Russia. That's why that's why earlier, there was property reform when you had been earlier like that. Better off. In the middle of better off. Baloney. Oh, yeah. That's well, you can leave the bank and put credit on it and build a factory. You can't leave the land. Just like they did and in you Singapore. gotta work for the guy that he keeps all the crops for himself. This is what you're advancing. No, That's it's not what I'm advancing. Well, you died. You don't know anything about agriculture. Sure. And those sure. and those were the Slavic people, by the way, that maintained that into the 19th century. That's why they why do you think they thought the peasants revolted in Russia? Why do you think my grandfather left? To get away from that kind of stuff, that system. Are you kidding? Wandering around? I can't they did. They put them all to work. If they had worked for you, yeah. They, oh, if you wandering around, they arrested you. 
where you, where are you at? <laughs> and the other thing is, are you, are you maintaining, if to, to anybody that knows this, I suggest you take and you visit a utopian community or the Amish communities here in the United States where the people engage in agriculture for the benefit of everyone in the community. And they've been prospering for a long, long time. Believe you me, they're prospering. Some of the Pennsylvania farmers that I knew were a little up, upset with the Amish because when a farm came up for sale, they could bid more than higher at the auction than anyone else. But don't tell me cooperative agriculture is not uh, doesn't work. That's not the case. These guys gamble up as much farm as they can see what we could do work. And they're doing quite well. Now go to Iowa, the Amana colonies, and so forth. And you'll see the same thing. Uh, they've even began getting into non-agricultural occupations and enterprises. But you seem to think it doesn't work, but there's evidence of it right there. Um, anyhow. I think I've counted everything. You guys say, hey, work on it, guys. You did really good, but there's, there's no challenge. Anyhow, thank you all for coming, and I hope you learned something. All right. We'll close out tonight with. Uh... Anyway, that's enough of that. All right, we're going to close out and stop the recording. Hope all you guys have a good day, all right? And stick around for the chat for a few minutes.